The Life of Free Ren Free Ren is the eponymous elven protagonist of Free Ren Beyond Journey's End. Functionally immortal, she was the mage of the hero party and traveled alongside hero Himmel, warrior Aisen, and priest Heiter in a 10-year journey to defeat the Demon King. These days, after that adventure has been long put to rest, she journeys with a new cast of characters, experiencing life in different ways than she could have ever expected. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, only 25% of our viewers are subscribed, so if you're a fan of the video, please like and double check if you are subscribed. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Early Life Approximately a millennium ago, Freeren was born and raised in an elven village, where she was notably the most powerful amongst the residents. She held a high concentration of mana, and was left the sole survivor of an attack on her village led by Basalt the Throne, a general of the Demon King's army, whom she ultimately managed to defeat. After being rescued by the human mage Flem, she was taken in as her apprentice. Through her apprenticeship, Freeren was trained to forever conceal her mana like her master as a deception strategy against demons. As her mentor, Flam was able to predict Freeren's future predicaments, such as her desire to understand humans on a deeper level, and made preparations to guide her a thousand years in advance. At some point, Flam brought Freeren to meet Seri, another elf and Flam's former master. Although Seri voiced her approval with her strength, she was disappointed by Freeren's devotion towards the pursuit of magic when given the opportunity to receive any grimoire she desired. However, Flam assured her that Freeren would become capable of defeating the Demon King and bringing about a peaceful era, even when Seri couldn't. Freeren remained Flam's apprentice until she passed away from old age nearly half a century later. Prior to this, Flam entrusted Freeren to defeat the Demon King and taught her her favorite magic, flowerbed magic. Upon her death, Freeren performed this magic to respect her master's final wish of growing a flower bed around her grave. Afterwards, Freeren adventured solo across the country and continued pursuing various forms of magic. During this time, she met a young Himmel after he'd gotten lost in the woods and showed him her master's flower bed magic. Although Freeren herself did not recall the encounter, this memory left a major impression on Himmel and would lead his grown up self to search for and recruit Freeren for the hero party, ultimately, formed to defeat the Demon King. Beyond Journey's End Arc After at least 900 years of life, Freeren was recruited by the hero Himmel and joined the hero party as its mage, where they journeyed alongside Priest Hater and Warrior Isen to the Demon King's castle and end in order to defeat the Demon King. Ten years later, after managing to defeat the Demon King and his army, the hero party returned to the royal capital and watched the Era Meteors together, disbanding with the promise of seeing the Meteors together again in 50 years. Afterwards, Freeren planned to explore the central provinces for a century, and she continued to journey around whilst acquiring magic. After 50 years passed, Freeren reunited with Himmel, Hyder, and Isen in order to see the meteors together as promised. Soon after, Himmel passed away and she attended his funeral. During the procession, Freeren broke into tears and voiced her regret over not getting to know him more given the length of a human's lifespan. Influenced by this event, she continued on her journey to pursue magic with the intention of also learning and understanding humans more. Twenty years after Himmel's passing, Freeren sought out Hyder in the outskirts of the holy city Strahl and stumbled across a young girl named Fern, whom Hyder had saved. When Hyder requested that Freeren make Fern a mage in training her apprentice, she refused, citing the high death rate of mage apprentices on the battlefield. However, Hyder then requested that she decipher a grimoire on resurrection and immortality while training Fern in her free time, to which she agreed. After five or six years, she had inadvertently ended up training Fern to a point where she was no less capable than an adult, and acknowledging Hyder's scheme, she finally agreed to take on Fern as her apprentice. After Hyder passed, she and Fern visited his grave before setting off on their journey together. Six years after her initial encounter with Fern, and 26 years following Himmel's passing, Freeren engages in various jobs alongside Fern within the Turk region of the Central Lands in exchange for grimoires that enable them to perform trivial forms of magic. After completing one of their jobs, an elderly woman approaches them and requests their assistance in cleaning a statue dedicated to the late Himmel. Upon successfully cleaning the statue, the lady voices her desire to embellish it with a flower bed, and Freeren proposes Blue Moon Weed, a local flower from Himmel's hometown. The lady recognizes the name and mentions how all the ones previously in the area had unfortunately been destroyed. Nevertheless, Freeren insists on looking for one and recreating a flower bed with it. They then spend half a year searching. And when Fern is on the verge of giving up, the lady gives her seeds of a related flower to use as a reference. 
While she's with Free Wren, a seed rat steals the seeds, and they chase it to an abandoned tower inhabited with many other rats. Free Wren flies to the top of the tower and discovers the entire ceiling covered in blue moonweed, the product of the seed rats burying their seeds in the tower. Upon viewing the huge growth of flowers, she reflects on how Himmel initially wanted to show her the beauty of the blue moonweed during their adventure. Returning to the statue, Free Wren successfully cultivates a blue moonweed flower bed, and she places a flower crown of the blue moonweed on Himmel's head. With the job complete, they set forth to their next destination. The pair arrive at the trading city of Warm. Free Wren proposes they split up to purchase necessities, but Fern grows suspicious of her intentions after seeing Free Wren's face and chooses to follow her in secret. Free Wren first visits a jewelry stall and appears visibly stressed over choosing an item, confusing Fern. Her next stop is a tavern, where she seeks local dessert shop recommendations from fellow adventurers. Reuniting at the inn, Free Wren invites Fern to eat dessert together. At the shop, Free Wren gives Fern a butterfly hair ornament as a gift for her 16th birthday, and Fern accepts it with gratitude, thanking Free Wren for her thoughtfulness and efforts in understanding her better. After leaving Warm, Fern inquires about the purpose of their journey, prompting Free Wren to share her goal of acquiring magic and retracing the footsteps of the hero party to reminisce about their adventures together. As they continue their travels across the central lands, they eventually encounter the Gros Forest, where Free Wren conducts a training session for Fern. After the session, they stumble across a village where an elderly man welcomes and guides them to the site of Qual, a demon sealed away by Free Wren during her journey with the hero party 80 years prior. Free Wren reveals that she returned with the intent to kill Qual, as the seal's expiration was imminent. The man expresses that he expected she would come, as Himmel had reassured him during his previous visits. After assessing the seal's condition, Free Wren declares her plan to release and confront the demon the following day. That evening, Free Wren explains to Fern that Qual was too strong for the hero party when they first fought him, hence why she sealed him away instead of killing him. She also reveals to Fern that Qual was the original creator of Zoltrak, a piercing magic that resulted in the demise of numerous adventurers and mages within the region. The next morning, Free Wren unseals Qual, and he promptly unleashes Zoltrak on the two mages. Fern easily defends against it with her magic, and she realizes that Zoltrak is present-day offense magic, the result of many years of human research. Although Qual tries to retaliate with another attack, Free Wren strikes him first with Zoltrak, ultimately annihilating him with his own creation. Later, Free Wren accepts a job from an elderly man to clean up the coast along the Grand's Channel in exchange for a grimoire written by Flam, albeit fake. Three months pass, and the cleanup job lasts into the winter, though Free Wren reassures the old man that they will finish by the new year. During their work, Fern contemplates how she's always performing motherly duties for Free Wren due to her laziness, and wonders how her former party members felt. Free Wren shares that they were rather tolerant of her, but they got upset once because she overslept and missed the New Year's sunrise at that very village. The mages manage to finish cleaning up the shore one day before the new year. When the sunrise starts the next morning, Fern manages to wake Free Wren, and they enjoy watching it together. Free Wren and Fern journey to the Brett region, where Free Wren reunites with Isen for the first time in 30 years. They accompany Isen on a search for writings by the great mage Flam, Free Wren's former master, in the Vol Basin, which Hyder had previously looked into. Isen explained that he pitied Free Wren for her regrets about not getting to know Himmel and wanted to help her locate the notes, rumored to contain references of Flam conversing with the dead. Free Wren guides them to a giant tree, acting as a barrier over the ruins of a building, and she enters, immediately being confronted with a book. She recalls how Flem foresaw that she would seek advice in the future after experiencing regrets. Upon reading through the notes, she learns of Flem's conversations with the dead at the northernmost end of the continent, and the site of Oriol, known as the land where souls rest, and also the location of the Demon King's castle. With a proper destination in mind, Free Wren decides to journey with Fern there and pursue the opportunity to meet Himmel once more. They bid farewell to Isen and set their course to Oriol. Free Wren and Fern arrive at a village in the Willa region, where they are advised by the residents to avoid crossing the mountain pass due to recent disappearances. After listening to other witness accounts, they decide to investigate. Fern detects phantom magic, and Free Wren tells her that the perpetrators are Einsam, phantom demons that use illusions of loved ones to lure humans in, and instructs her to immediately blast one with magic if she comes across an illusion. They venture into the forest and slowly get surrounded by fog. Fern is greeted by an illusion of Hyder and freezes, while Free Wren, expecting to see an illusion of her master, encounters one of Himmel instead. She does not hesitate to shoot him with magic, and when the demon materializes above the illusion, Fern manages to attack and kill it as well. Free Wren and Fern venture to the Rigel Canyon and observe a solar dragon guarding its nest, which contains one of Free Wren's desired grimoires. Fern attacks the dragon with her magic, however it hardly deals any damage and instead aggravates it, which forces them to flee. They decide to recruit Isen's warrior apprentice Stark for help, as he's currently residing in a nearby village. 
The villagers bring them to Stark and praise him for driving off the dragon three years prior, thus granting them safety ever since. Stark attempts to dissuade Freeren from fighting the dragon, but upon her questioning, he reveals his cowardice and lack of battle experience. Freeren observes a giant crevice nearby and tells Stark that he has one night to consider his options. The mages spend the night in the village, where they learn that the public's opinion of Stark is quite high. Although Fern has doubts about Stark's capabilities, Freeren puts her trust in him due to a past conversation she had with Isen. The next morning, Stark agrees to help fight the dragon, under the condition that they will defeat it even if he dies in the process. As Stark faces the dragon, Freeren notices the similarities between Stark and Isen and explains to Fern that the dragon avoided the village after facing Stark upon realizing the warrior's incredible strength. Stark lands a blow on the dragon and yells at the mages to attack, but Freeren stops Fern from interfering, much to Stark's distress. Freeren points out that the first blow killed the dragon and praises Stark for his efforts. She then proceeds to loot the nest, and Stark mentions how Isen found the hero party's journey enjoyable due to her carefree pursuit of magic. With the dragon defeated, Stark decides to join the mages on their journey, and they depart from the village. In the Fortress of Wall, the two are refused entry into the Northern Lands through Wall's checkpoints due to high monster activity. Freeren, ecstatic at the opportunity to spend time researching magic, separates from Stark and Fern to visit a magic shop. She later meets up with them while hiding from the Castellan, but he spots her and profusely apologizes for the rudeness of the guard captain at the checkpoint. He recognizes her as the mage of the hero party, and under the impression that they're looking to virtuously drive out the conflicts of the north, grants the party entry past the checkpoint, much to Freeren's dismay. They exit the city in the presence of a large crowd celebrating them and enter the northern lands. Freeren reminisces about Flam's fairy tale like presence during her journey with the hero party, and considers how she might be the only one who remembers her face. In the present day, she wakes up early, receiving much praise from Fern. The party continues on to the Eng Road and comes across a landslide that blocks off the path, where a merchant and his wagon are unable to cross. Freeren removes the rubble with Fern and Stark, and she explains to Stark that instead of simply helping the merchant pass with flying magic, clearing the path would make it easier for other travelers. The merchant thanks the party and comments that Freeren is the first elf he has met over his long life. Freeren explains that due to the lack of romance or reproductive instincts among elves, her species numbers are dwindling, and she has not seen another elf in over 400 years. They arrive at a nearby town where the Liberation Festival, an annual celebration of the hero party, creates a bustling atmosphere. Freeren feels indifferent to the celebration and considers it excessive, but the merchant expresses that although it has been 80 years since the Demon King's defeat, the town still remembers that day. Freeren is reminded of a conversation she had with Himmel. He claimed affection for his statues as they both preserved his existence in the world and served as future companions for Freeren once she outlived other party members. The merchant and Freeren's party enjoy the celebration in front of a statue of the hero party members decorated with flower crowns. Afterwards, they continue upon their journey. Demon Infiltration Freeren, Fern, and Stark make it to Graf Granat's domain. As the trio walks into town, Freeren senses some demon and tries to kill them, but she's stopped by sentinels. The demon, led by Lord Lugner, are supposedly messengers of peace. However, Freeren calls them incomprehensible wild beasts that mimic human voices. She's then thrown into the mansion dungeon. Fern and Stark investigate and find out Aura the Guillotine, a great demon who served the Demon King as one of the Seven Sages of Destruction, has requested peace after being long at war with the town. Freeren states that it's futile to negotiate with demon, as they only use words as a means of deception rather than communication. She decides to break out of the dungeon once the disorder starts. Meanwhile, Lugner wonders where he has seen Freeren before and smiles as she's the only one in town who knows the true nature of demon. Drat enters the dungeon after easily decapitating the sentinel at its entrance. He enters Freeren's cell and introduces himself as a subordinate of Aura the Guillotine, and one of her executioners, stating that he's come to kill her. Freeren warns him that she is powerful, far more than Aura the Guillotine, shocking Drat. He doubts her, telling her it's already over as he hangs her from the neck on a beam on the ceiling with a magical wire. Freeren is easily able to prevent her decapitation by concentrating her magical power on her neck. She remarks how hopeless demon are now as they fight like infants. Freeren cuts off Drott's arm which was holding the wire and then quickly cuts off his other as he makes his wires form from that as well. She lands on him and decapitates him, killing him and remarking that this is the first one to start. Freeren exits the dungeon and finds the sentinel dead. Meanwhile, Fern and Stark are having lunch, and Fern decides that they should go appeal to Graf Granat for Freeren's release from prison, and then defeat the demon. Stark agrees, as they do not look like enemies they can face alone, especially Lugner, who seemed incredibly powerful. As even with everyone around, he sets his eyes only on Freeren, as he believes he can eliminate people like Stark and Fern any time. Fern tells Stark the hero party would go regardless of if it would end up in a fight, and Stark agrees. 
In Graf Granad's mansion, Linny tells Lugner that she cannot detect Drott's mana anymore, and he surmises that he must have been killed by Freeren. Granat enters the room and tells him that the mage they apprehended has escaped and beheaded a sentinel. Lugner offers to help in the search, but Graf refuses and notes how they're missing a person. Lugner tries to lie by saying he went to the restroom, but Graf sees through it and asks again where the third demon is. Realizing their plan has failed, Lugner uses his magic to behead all the sentinels that were with Graf Granit, calling Drott an incompetent fool and remarking how he has ruined everything. Yet being in the situation which only he can settle through violence made him excited, as they are wild beasts after all. As Fern and Stark head to the Graf's estate, Fern spots Freeren stealthily walking in a black cloak. Freeren tells them how she killed the demon named Drott, and that when demon perish, they turn into particles of mana and disappear. So it would seem like Freeren was the one who killed the sentinel. She thinks that she would suffer capital punishment, so decides to leave town. Fern asks her if she's planning to abandon the town as the remaining demon would reign free. Freeren asks why couldn't Fern and Stark deal with them, and Stark replies that they don't seem like enemies they can face. Freeren asks rhetorically if they would not fight an enemy if they were strong, leaving Fern and Stark speechless. She tells them that she does not think they're weaker than the demon in the slightest, and leaves them, despite Stark's pleas. Freeren senses a tremendous magic power a distance away from the town and recognizes it as Aura the Guillotine. Freeren comments on how she despises fighting powerful enemies and must finish quickly what she dislikes. As Lugna remembers a scene from his past, Freeren looks down upon him from the top of a pile of demon corpses. He realizes that the mage from the morning was Freeren, saying that she greatly contributed to the human's research of Zoltrak, and is known as the mage who sent the most demon to the grave in all of history. Stark and Fern discuss with Graf Granite how Freeren and the hero party had protected the town from Aura before. Granite reveals that Aura fights with a magical object known as the Scales of Obedience, which weighs Aura's mana against her opponents. The being with the more mana is then given control over the one with less. Elsewhere, Freeren calls Aura out on her use of magic to animate fallen soldiers, and the two clash. Freeren resorts to anti-magic to dispel Aura's control over the bodies rather than blasting them away as she had done in the past, as that had angered Himmel. Fern is about to kill Lugner, and before he perishes, he's questioned, but with no answer. It then flashes back to Freeren's past, where she encounters Flam after her village was destroyed. Despite Freeren overpowering the demon who attacked her village, she couldn't protect anyone. Freeren and Flam then proceeded to have a conversation, only to be rudely interrupted by some demon. As a result, Flam eliminates them with ease, to which Freeren is left awestruck. Freeren then follows Flam as her apprentice. The next scene is shown to be the battle between Freeren and Aura. During the fight with Aura, Freeren restricts her mana, which results in Aura calling her weak, overlooking her abilities. As Freeren releases the seal placed upon herself, she commands Aura to kill herself. Graf Granite thanks Freeren for minimizing the casualties. As he looks at the dead bodies, he sees one reminiscent of his sons, before commenting to give them a proper burial. As Freeren leaves the battlefield, she commends Stark and Fern in successfully beating Lugner and his accomplice. At Graf's mansion, Freeren asks for a grimoire. However, Graf Granite reveals that it is a fake, and Freeren says she knew all along and it was just a hobby of hers. They soon depart from the city. As they leave, they are informed that they need to take a magic association exam. But as they head out, they get lost in the snow. Travels to Oberst. Freeren's party is in the deck region. Stark collapses and there's a heavy snowstorm, so they seek shelter in an old cabin. As they enter, they see an elf doing squats and quickly exit. Fern protests staying there and suggests finding another place as there is a pervert inside. Before they could leave, the elf opens the door and asks Freeren if she's an elf. They head inside, and the elf, who is a monk named Kraft, converses with Freeren about how long it's been since he encountered another elf, and how he arrived in the cabin. As Stark rests in the cabin after being warmed up by Kraft, Freeren and Fern help Kraft carry food from his cart. It's revealed that Kraft and Freeren do not know each other at all. Half a year passes as they stay in the cabin due to the dangerous weather. Kraft and Freeren have a discussion on the goddess of creation, showing how Kraft believes in her and heaven as well. Kraft asks Freeren to tell him about herself, so that he can honor her. This causes Freeren to remember how Heiter asked the same of her in the past. Freeren's party and Kraft part ways as they continue on their separate adventures. Next, Freeren's party is in the Northern Lands. During a flashback of the hero party, Freeren complains that the king is a cheapskate, and that he only gave the party 10 copper coins for their journey. Heiter says that it wasn't entirely uncalled for, since many have tried to defeat the Demon King, only to have been unsuccessful. Himmel says that it isn't so bad, comparing it to an adventure, and Heiter agrees. They change the subject when Freeren asks if Himmel's blade is the fabled hero's blade. Himmel says that it's just a replica he was gifted when he saved a peddler visiting his village from a demon. Himmel mentioned that the peddler said for the hero of the future while giving it to him. 
Three Ren asks if this was his motivation to become a hero, and Himmel replies in the negative. He recounts a time when he was young, a kid said that since he only has a fake sword, you can only become a fake hero. That's when Himmel thought, why not just become a real one then, and that he would take the real hero's blade and take down the Demon King. He then jokingly says that time is merciless. The kid who said that is now a fake priest who spends his days drinking. Hyder corrects Himmel, saying that he is an actual priest. Free Ren wakes up from her dream and the flashback ends. They're in the northern lands, specifically the Shuar Mountains. They're traveling through a blizzard. Free Ren had underestimated the weather in the mountains. She tells Fern, who is currently carrying her, to press on north since that's where their destination village is. Fern asks if Free Ren can walk and she says no. Stark offers to carry her as Fern must be tired, but Fern calls him a pervert. They reach their destination and then the blizzard has subsided. Near the entrance of the village, they see a broken down building. They're welcomed to the village of swords by the village chief, who is a child. While walking with the chief, Free Ren asks what the destroyed building was. The chief tells Free Ren that it was the hunter's cabin in the past and that it was destroyed by the ruler of the mountains. Free Ren tries to recall if there was ever a ruler of the mountains. Stark comments on being in the Village of Swords. Free Ren asks if Stark was aware of it. Stark says that it's the village that protected the hero's blade, a sword that was allegedly bestowed by the goddess and was enshrined at a holy ground nearby. Historically, no hero could ever pull it out until 80 years later. Stark says that there was a legend about it and the chief tells him that the legends say that only the hero that could pull it out was the hero that drove out the Great Calamities. Fern adds in that it was Himmel that allegedly pulled out the sword and Stark confirms. Stark is confused on how Fern doesn't know the story since it's very famous and she replies that Hyder had never mentioned it. They go into a building where Freerent and the chief converse. The chief is angry at Freerent since she was late on her promise to return a half century later. Freerent says that she told them that it would be safe for the next 80 years, but the village chief says that she still has to fulfill her duty. Fern asks what the chief means by duty and Freerent tells her it's a demon extermination. The chief says that the ruler of the mountains has been quite violent lately. Freerent then decides that they'll start the next day. The next day, they defeat many demons. Fern asks why they haven't issued a subjugation request despite the situation being so bad. The chief replies that they wanted to, but Himmel was the hero after all, which leaves Fern confused. Stark sees more demons gathering at the entrance of a cave and proceeds to exterminate them. He was about to say something to Free Ren, but gets knocked down by the ruler of the mountains. Free Ren asks Stark if he can still move. Stark cuts the ruler's arm off and calls her a cruel boss, moving out of the way. Free Ren and Fern then proceed to exterminate the ruler of the mountains. Stark confronts Free Ren about what is inside the cave, which is the hero's blade. She tells them that it was the reason that the demons were gathering by the entrance of the cave. They cannot resist the urge to destroy the blade, even though it's protected by a powerful barrier. Stark says that that's not what he meant. Free Ren understands and tells him that Himmel could not pull the sword out, recalling the time the hero's party went to the village of swords. Himmel has just unsuccessfully tried to pull out the sword. Hyder tries to console him, but before he could, Himmel says that it's fine to be a fake hero. Himmel is still determined to defeat the Demon King. As long as he does, it doesn't matter if he's a real or fake hero. Freerun says that even without the sword, Himmel proved that he could save the world and that he is a true hero. Fern asks why this was kept a secret, and Freerun says that it was probably the doing of those who wanted Himmel to be the hero. She says that unsavory anecdotes like that would be detrimental for the hero, and says that the hero will always be glorified by future generations, and eventually their original story would become obscured. The village chief thanks Freerun's party, and asks Freerun not to be late next time. They continue on their voyage. Soon, it's Stark's 18th birthday. Fern and Freerun talk about a potion that Freerun bought and it pans over to Stark looking at the clouds whilst commenting on how they look, which Fern notes to be rather childish. Fern then proceeds to spark up a conversation which leads to Stark disclosing about his childhood. Next up, they make it to the northern lands, specifically the cool region. From atop a cliff, the party are able to see Overst off in the distance. Freerun remarks that they will need to catch a coach the rest of the way. As they continue to walk, they discuss their travel plans, with Fern musing that after Freerun obtains the qualification to become a first-class mage in Overst, the party will be able to continue onwards to the northern plateau. However, Freerun tells Fern to become a first-class mage instead, as she is uninterested in a title that will soon be obsolete. Fern tells Freerun that only a select few mages are able to become first class, thus she will most likely not be able to obtain the title, but despite her words, Freerun remains uninterested in the exam. 
Sometime later, the trio have caught a coach that will take them to Alverst. As they sit in the back, the three discuss the upcoming first class mage exam. Freerin states that she will investigate the nature of the exam once they arrive, but as it is likely there will be combat, they need to strategize. Fern questions the necessity of strategizing with Freerin's mana, as despite Freerin's limitation on her own mana, as a skilled and elderly mage, her mana is still able to be seen. This in turn causes Freerin to pout, and seeing that she's pouting, Stark bids Fern to apologize for her commentary on Freerin's age. However, However, Freerun merely shoots at Stark that she still remembers him calling her a stinking hag, and then she lies down on Fern's lap in order to take a nap. However, noticing that Fern's chest has grown, Freerun decides to forego a nap as she is only able to see half the sky lying down. Now perched near the back of the wagon, Freerun gives Fern a word of caution that mana is not the only thing that determines a mage's strength, since factors such as technique, experience, spell usage, and handling, effort, and willpower are important as well. This causes Stark to comment that it sounds like mages are part warrior as well. Freerun then mentions that the last quality that can make a mage's strength superior is simply talent. In her life, she has lost 11 times to mages who possess less mana. Four of them were demons, Qual included. One was an elf, and the remaining six were humans. At the northern branch of the Continental Magic Association, Freerun and Fern are registering for the first class mage exam. They're informed by the clerk that the exam will occur in two months, and that to qualify for the exam, they must be a fifth class major better. Hearing this, Freerun tells Fern to break a leg, and tries to walk out of the room, only for Fern to catch her by the sleeve and entreat her to participate alongside her. Freerun is adamant that Fern can become a first class mage on her own, and when Fern asks what they will do if she fails, Freerun flippantly says that they will just hire a first class mage or travel north by sea. Even when Fern refutes Freerun by bringing up the enormous expense of traveling by sea or hiring a first class mage, Freerun brings up that she is unqualified to participate, since she never took a class examination with the current magic association. The only thing she has is her holy emblem, which Fern doesn't even recognize. However, an older mage appears and recognizes the Holy Emblem, and allows Freerun to participate in the first class exam. As they leave the Continental Magic Association and walk on the streets of Elverst, Freerun expresses her surprise that there is anyone alive who still recognizes her Holy Emblem, which should be considered an incredible object. In a flashback, Himmel asks Freerun if she's a member of the Mages Guild, the organization that governs magic in the time of the Heroes Party. Freerun explains that because magic organizations change so frequently, it would be illogical for her to join each and every one of them. She then holds out her holy emblem with pride, implying that with it, joining an organization would be unnecessary. However, Himmel, Hyder, and Isen are unable to recognize her holy emblem, leaving Freerun in low spirits since the holy emblem is her only proof of being a mage. Seeing this, Himmel reassures Freerun that though the hero's party may not know of her necklace, they do know that Freerun is an incredible mage. However, Freerun merely refutes that her party members will soon be dead, leaving Himmel with a melancholic expression on his face. Recalling this memory in the present day, Freerun again looks pensive. However, Fern calls out to her and reassures her that she and Stark both know that Freerun is incredible, just as Himmel did in the past. Freerun appears surprised, before this time acknowledging Fern's statement by patting her hair. Freerun and Fern then go to a library in Overst, where they begin to research about the Continental Magic Association. In the meantime, Stark sleeps on the table. Freerun summarizes from a book that mages are considered to be adults once they reach at least 5th class. She then asks Fern why she chose to become a third class mage, with Fern replying that it's simply because the exam was scheduled the earliest. Continuing her reading, Freerun narrates that there are around 2,000 mages total, with around 600 mages that are at least 5th class and the remainder being 6th to 9th class apprentices. Of the 5th class or higher mages, there exists only 45 first class mages total. The first class exam is held every three years at the northern branch of the Continental Magic Association and the headquarters in the holy city of Strahl. For many years, no one passes the first class mage exam. Casualties are not unheard of either. Placing the book back on the shelf, Freerun muses that the number of mages in recent times has significantly decreased, as back when the Demon King army's offensive intensified, there would be many mages found in any town, whereas nowadays only magical towns have a concentration of mages at all. With their research on the exam complete, Freerun and Fern decide to train in order to prepare for the first class mage exam. Over the next two months, they train their magic in various ways, including staff handling, spell practice, and research. During the two months, the party also celebrates Freerun's birthday. 
Finally, after two months have passed, Freerun and Fern, along with various other first-class mage hopefuls, gather at an ornately decorated building, where Jano, a first-class mage who is introduced as the first exam proctor, commences the first-class mage selection exam. At the side of the hall, two unknown mages comment on the impressive backgrounds of some of the competitors. Weirbel, with a fur cloak and shaggy pale-colored hair, is introduced as the second-class captain of the Northern Magic Corps, which has been active in the fight against remnants of the Demon King army. Fern is revealed to be the youngest mage to ever not only pass the third class exam, but obtain the highest grade as well. Denkin, also a second class mage, is an imperial mage who came out on top in a violent power struggle. The same mage from before then notices that there are troublemakers participating this time around, especially Ubel, who he remembers having killed a first class proctor of the second class exam two years ago. Following this, the mage ascertains other promising competitors. Upon sensing Freeren's mana, he thinks to himself that her mana expression is that of an elder mage's, and asks his companion who Freeren is. Neither he nor his companion seem to be able to recognize Freeren. Geno then announces the details of the first exam. It will be a team battle with three mages in each group. He divides all 57 competitors by giving each competitor a ring. Each ring is marked with a number that represents which party each competitor is in, and party members may be identified by imbuing the ring with mana. Freeren is on the second team. As Freeren walks to her party, she thinks that cooperation with other mages impromptu may be difficult. As such, she resolves to have a good first impression on her team. However, as she finds the rest of her party, she sees that her party members, both girls around Fern's age, are already fighting with each other, with one of them pulling the other's pigtails. Seeing this, Freeren looks resigned. Meanwhile, Fern finds her team members as well. One of them is a male mage with glasses, while the other is Ubel. Ubel and Fern both greet each other, bearing the bracelets that show they are the fourth team as the first exam is set to begin. All the examinees gather up with their party members and each party is shown holding a small cage. The proctor of the first exam proceeds to explain the rules of it. He holds up a cage with a small bird inside, which he introduces as the meteoric iron bird, otherwise known as the still. In order to pass the first stage of the exam, he says that each party, to which he has distributed a cage, must fulfill two conditions. They must possess a cage still by sundown the next day, and all three party members must be present. This means that leaving the examination grounds will result in the disqualification of a party. Freeren's teammates question the necessity of his warning when he has put up a powerful barrier spell that completely prevents passage in or out of the examination grounds, even by a speck of dust. After his explanation, Geno announces that the first stage examination will now begin. As different parties begin to scatter, Freeren's teammates continue to fight over the cage and the team's priorities. One of the mages indicates that they should form a plan before they do anything, while the other argues that until they find a still, they can't make any plans to capture it. Seeing that there is no end to their fighting, Freeren tells her teammates to settle the matter of who holds the cage over rock, paper, scissors, and directs everyone to introduce themselves as they walk, which is who went to the same academy. After introductions, Freeren asks the two if they know anything about their target. Both of them do not, and Freeren admits that while she knows of the still, she has never seen one in person. She thus decides their first goal should be to find one and observe it. The second party proceeds to traverse through the heavily forested area in search of a bird, all while Kana and Lavina continue to bicker and fight. Later in the day, as they walk into a clearing, Kane begins to complain that she's tired. Though Lavina chides her, Freeren sits down in a log and asks if the party would like to take a break. Kane is quick to sit down opposite Freeren, but Lavina states that she isn't so tired as to need rest yet and decides to scout ahead. This incites another argument between her and Kane, with Kane saying they should stick together for safety, with Lavina arguing that it'd be more time efficient if she goes ahead. Exasperated, Freeren asks Lavina whether she's powerful. Lavina quickly says that she's more powerful than Kane, nearly causing another fight between the two. But but Freeren interjects and asks Lavina if she's powerful compared to Freeren herself. This causes Lavina to grow serious and she tells Freeren that she would not want to fight her. Hearing this, Freeren tells her she's free to go scout but to come back immediately if there's danger. As she departs, Freeren advises her to be careful of the sky, which Lavina responds dismissively to as she was already aware of potential danger above them. However, Kane reacts with confusion at Freeren's warning. Left alone with Kane, Freeren slumps on the log, wondering if their party will be alright. Kane tells Freeren that she seems like a professor and that Freeren would make a good leader, but Freeren refutes by saying she's only stepping up because Kane and Lavina keep fighting amongst themselves. This causes Kane to apologize and she mentions that she and Lavina have been this way since long ago. Kane then asks Freeren what she meant when she told Lavina to be wary of the sky. Freeren tells her that her advice was literal and questions whether Kane has trouble sensing mana. Kane wonders why Freeren wants to know, but before Freeren can reply, the two of them are interrupted by Lavina, who returns and reports that she has found a still. 
Freerin and Kane join Lavine by the lake, where Estelle is splashing in the shallows. Freerin praises Lavine and tells her party members to carefully observe the bird, but she's cut off by Kane casting water manipulation magic with her staff. Sensing the disturbance in the water, the bird soars upwards, and Kane manipulates the lake water into a spiral that follows it. However, Freerin notes that they still will be able to escape the water's reach. Lavina contradicts this as she casts her own magic, which freezes the still in the air within Kane's water. Freerin appears impressed by their teamwork, but she quickly kneels and tells her teammates to take cover. Shortly after this, the still bursts out of its ice restraints and soars away at supersonic speeds. Freerun explains to her teammates that the still is highly robust and can fly faster than the speed of sound, which makes most physical restraints meaningless for it. As a result, the best course of action for them to take would be to spend the rest of the day observing one. Kane and Levine acquiesce, both of them commenting on the chance the party has wasted. Behind them, Freerun stands lost in thought about Kane and Levine's display of magic, noting that the two girls' timing and coordination could not have been achieved overnight, and that with this, their team had potential in capturing one of the birds. However, Kane and Levine begin arguing again, which causes Freerun to abandon her train of thought. Later, they find and observe a still by a pond, and another perched atop a rock, though ultimately they capture neither. As night approaches, the party sets up camp in a clearing. Sometime later during the night, Kana awakens to an unidentified sound. She notices that Freeren is gone from their camp and goes searching for her. As Kane walks, she confirms that the sound that she's been hearing is rain, but to her confusion, there's nothing falling from the sky. Staring skyward, Kane seems to recognize the reason behind the rain not falling, but distracted by her own thoughts, she's caught by surprise when a large bird monster strikes her on the shoulder using its sharp tail. Kane is quick to summon her staff, but the bird monster strikes at her with its talons and knocks her down. Unable to reach her staff, and with the bird monster looming over her, Kane calls out for Lavine. She's saved by Freerun appearing from the sky and subduing the bird monster with magic. The two begin to walk back to the camp in silence, which Freerun eventually breaks to ask Kane if she's calmed down after her ordeal. Freerun proceeds to ask Kane why she called out for Lavine, since she thought Kane and Lavine hated each other based on their fighting. Kane agrees with Freeren, saying that she does hate her, which leads Freeren to ask how they were able to synchronize their magic so well. Kane admits that she can freeze up at crucial times due to her cowardice and recalls an instance of her freezing up during her first flight magic training. Because of this, Levine says that if Kane does not have the courage to fly, that she can kick her off the cliff for a boost. Kane says that she hates Levine because she's always saying mean things, and Kane is the type who improves with praise. Kane tells Freeren that despite Levine's harshness, she's always led Kane properly. She reveals the lesson she learned from Levine, that even frightening things can work out well if left to impulse. This causes Freeren to recall a memory of the night before the hero party confronted their first dragon, where Himmel notices Aisen's shaking and asks if he's scared. Aisen quickly replies that he is in fact scared, and surprised, Himmel cuts his planned speech short. Himmel tells Aisen that he too is scared. Freerun calls out how strange their conversation is, and Himmel apologizes, as he had intended to encourage Aisen by acting as another adventurer, but his plan didn't work as intended. Aisen refutes this and tells Himmel that because of his words he is no longer nervous, and Heiter tells Himmel to just act as himself, since the way each adventuring companion deals with their fear surely differs. Freerun realizes that this applies to Kane as well. As they continue to walk back, Kane brings up the reason for the rain not falling within the examination grounds, and asks Freerun if it could be useful for capturing a still. Hearing this, Freerun begins to formulate a plan to easily catch one. Meanwhile, Fern returns to her party with a still in a cage and tells them they can relax, since they've captured one at last. However, her teammates warn that the first stage will only get worse from here, as their main objective must shift from catching the still to protecting it. Ubel smiles and declares that it's time for the battle royale to begin. The second party soon sits in a clearing and discusses what they've learned about the still. Kane confirms Freerun's claims that the still is able to fly faster than the speed of sound and is extremely robust, as she had attempted to catch one using flight magic and also blasted another with offensive magic to no avail. Levine adds that the still is highly sensitive to mana, but more importantly, it possesses almost no mana itself. As a result, they're impossible to detect. Levina and Kana hypothesize that the stills in the area are being extra vigilant due to all the examinees on the hunt, as the party has only seen three in total since they began their observation. The worst case scenario is that the party never sees one again, and Levine further adds that even if they encounter one, they have no way of capturing it. However, Freeran interjects and states that she has a solution for the latter problem, a spell that captures a bird, the same magic she used to save Kana the night before. Bird capturing magic is a powerful restraint magic that was developed by a tribe of hunters. Freeran notes that it could probably restrain the magic of any bird-like creature in general since it worked on the monster attacking Kana, 
While Lavina wonders why Freeren didn't just capture a still the day before with bird capturing magic, Freeren reveals the limitation of the magic. It only has a range of 50 centimeters. With the still's advanced magic detection, it is able to detect mages within 20 meters. Freeren asks Lavina and Kana if any of their spells would be able to stop the still long enough to get her within range. Lavina, who possesses freezing magic, believes she could stop the still if she were able to freeze it cleanly. However, due to the still's durability and speed, that's much easier said than done. Kana explains that her magic, rather than generating water, is actually magic that manipulates water. As a result, she requires a water source to use her magic. Rain, which consists of many dispersed droplets of water, is the ideal medium. For larger quantities of water, such as lakes, ponds, or streams, she must pour her mana into the body of water before she's able to control it. As a result, her magic would likely deter the mana-sensitive still. Freeren ponders Kana's words about stills being deterred by mana-infused water and thinks of a strategy that she relays to her teammates. Lavinai feels that the plan would likely work, but points out that it will draw the ire of all the other parties. Even after Kana points out that Freeren's plan may be their only chance of passing, Lavina still remains hesitant, which leads Kana to ask whether Lavina is afraid. This leads to Lavina sitting on Kana and pulling her pigtails. She then leaves Kana on the ground and tells Freeren that they should try her plan. While Fern's party takes on another party, Freeren herself is walking through a copse of trees. She's separated from the rest of her party. Lavina is running through the forest away from the lake, while Kana is pouring mana into a small pool of water elsewhere. As she fights, Fern wonders what Freeren could possibly be planning. Soon, the second party rendezvous at the pool Freeren arrived at. Kane reports that she poured her mana into any ponds and springs that she came across, but warns that she may have failed to notice other water sources in the basin. Freeren assures her that as long as they limit the sources of water that these stills in the basin have access to, their plan should work. Now that her party members have reported back, Freeren sits down and conceals her mana to the point it disappears in order to ambush one. Lavina expresses her shock that Freeren is able to make her mana completely disappear, but Freeren points out that she must maintain complete stillness or else mana will end up leaking out. Lavina and Kana move back into the forest to serve as lookouts, with Lavina telling Kana to not hold her back. The pair begin to bicker, with Kana arguing that she is a powerful ally to have in the rain, leading Lavina to point out that the barrier would repel any rain, thus Kana is effectively useless. Meanwhile, Freeren continues to wait. Various forms of wildlife approach the pool, including at one point a geisel. Finally, after much time has elapsed, a still alights on Freeren's shoulder. She smiles at it before restraining it with her spell that captures a bird. Seeing this, Lavina and Kana approach and ask if Freeren was able to capture it, and Freeren shows them the cage with the bird inside. Believing they have passed the first exam, Lavina and Kana sit down, disarmed, but Freeren warns them that the exam is not over yet. Elsewhere in the basin, the 13th party are resting in a clearing. Denkin senses Freeren's mana as she uses her spell to capture the bird. He states that no matter how superior a mage, they must ultimately resort to magic in the end, and usage of magic is impossible to mask. From her position on the ground, Lofin abruptly disappears, too quickly for Richter and Denkin to have even gotten up yet. Freeren notices that another party has detected them and tells Lavina and Kana that they should hurry and relocate, but as Lofin suddenly appears in front of the second party and blocks off their escape route, Freeren retracts her statement and observes that it's too late for that. With Lofin facing off with the second party, Denkin watches from afar. He notices Freeren. Since she is an elf, he assumes that she is a distinguished mage. He also thinks that Lofin's magic won't work on her again after Freeren sees it. However, that one time is enough since this is not a fight to the death. Lofin then disappears. Kana is shocked and shouts to Freeren that this still is gone. Freeren tells them that it looks like Lofin has taken it and calls her opponent's magic interesting. With Lofin having escaped, Freeren's team faces off with Denkin and Richter. Freeren asks them if the spell that Lofin used was Jilwer, which lets you move at high speeds. She also adds that it's a folk spell that belongs to a mountain tribe in the southern lands. Denkin confirms that it is. Freeren then tells them that they should have just stayed hidden and that Lofin could have stolen the still and run away alone. Denkin tells her that Lofin is still a novice and has left too many traces of her mana. He believes that Freeren could track her down easily. Denkin then guesses that Freeren must find it rather troublesome being held up by them. Freeren admits that this is true. She expresses surprise that he knows who she is. Denkin tells her that there isn't a single mage in his generation that hasn't heard her name, and that even though this was his first time seeing her in person, he was sure of it the moment he saw her. Denkin states that she is Freeren of the Hero Party. In the background, Kana asks if Freeren is famous, and Lavina whispers that Freeren is legendary. She tells Kana that she thought she could be Freeren, but she wasn't sure. 
Freerun questions why, even with the knowledge of her identity, Denkin's team chose to confront her directly. She asks them if they have been snooping around this whole time, and states that she expected them to make a dirtier move. Richter disagrees, telling her that what they're about to do is dirty enough. He reveals that while Freerun fights Denkin, he will kill one of either Kane or Levine. Freerun calmly says that it makes sense, since they'd be unable to pass if they lost a party member, so they'd have to resign. Denkin tells Richter not to do that, and that they just need to hold them off. Richter expected Denkin to be more ruthless. Richter claims that since Denkin is an Imperial mage, he has likely eliminated his fair share of opponents. Denkin responds to him by saying that he doesn't think that being a first class mage is worth someone's life. Freerun tells him that they at least agree on something. Richter calls Freerun hopeless, questioning why she decided to take this test without knowing about the privilege. Freerun is confused by this. Richter talks about the great mage Seri, who founded the Continental Magic Association more than half a century ago to reign over humanity's mages. He tells her that she still seeks out accomplished mages from the war against the Demon King. Richter tells her that Seri offers a special privilege to anyone who holds the position of first class mage, and this privilege is that she will bestow upon them a single spell that they desire. He compares Seri to a living grimoire who knows every spell known to humanity. She is the mage that is the closest comparison to the omnipotent goddess. He compares having any spell you desire granted to you as having your dream come true. He then tells her that people are simple-minded creatures, and then it leads all of the first-class mages to become inhuman monsters. However, Denkin calls that mindset ridiculous, and Richter retorts that Denkin is part of the minority that doesn't care. Richter then signals Denkin for them to begin. Richter asks Denkin to keep Freerun occupied for a minute, which he claims is enough time for him to kill the other two. Denkin tells Richter to just put them to sleep for a few hours. Richter, with a face of disapproval, calls him an old fool. Richter then begins to attack with the spell Bargland, which separates Freerun from the rest. Now alone, Denkin tells Freerun that the young are too hot-blooded and he couldn't care less for the privilege. Freerun asks why he thinks that. Denkin tells her that the pursuit of magic itself is the greatest joy. It then cuts to a flashback of Freerun, Flam, and Sari. Flam and Freerun are kneeling before Sari. Sari, while looking at them, muses how time flies. The apprentice that she raised on a whim has now found herself an apprentice of her own. Flam introduces Freerun to Sari, who comments on how she is an elf like her. She assumes that Freerun is strong, so she claims that she likes her already. She then asks Freerun to name any spell she desires, and she'll grant it to her. Sari claims to have knowledge of practically every grimoire ever written. Sari tells her that mages spend their entire lives in pursuit of magic, and for Freerun to name a spell. Freerun tells her that she doesn't need that, and that the pursuit of magic itself is the greatest joy. Sari tells Flam that the girl is no good, and that she lacks ambition. Flam tells her that Freerun will defeat the Demon King one day, and that she believes that a mage like her will open the path to a new era of peace. Sari asks Flam if she thinks that Freerun can defeat the Demon King when she cannot. Flam tells her that warmongers like them cannot defeat the Demon King. To drive her point home, she asks Sari if she can ever imagine herself living in peace. Flam then calls Freerun a mage who belongs in a peaceful era. It cuts back to the present. Freerun and Denkin are about to start their battle. Responding to what Denkin said earlier, Freerun says that that's what she likes to hear, and that's how mages should be. Freerun casts a spell, and though Jeannot states that it is impossible, manages to shatter Sari's barrier. This catches Sari's attention, as she'd been waiting for Freerun to reappear again. The rain that the barrier had previously held back begins pouring down. Using the rain, Lavina and Kana manage to easily overpower Richter with their magic, winning the battle. They're then able to leave with their still. After this, Jeannot introduces the six parties that have passed the first stage of the first class mage exam. He then explains that the second stage of the exam will begin in three days and dismisses all examinees. The next day, back in Alverst, Stark wakes up in the evening. Fern chastises Stark and Freeren for their childish antics and they decide to take Fern to a nice restaurant in town to make up for angering her. Meanwhile, Richter is shown working in a shop and repairing items with magic. Denkin and Lofen convince him to go to a restaurant with them, coincidentally the same one Freerun's party has decided to go to. Meanwhile, Ubel finds Land and starts a conversation with him. She knows that she is able to learn others' magic through empathy, as a result she wishes to get to know Land better. At the restaurant, Stark notes the exorbitant amount of food Freerun has ordered. Freerun recalls her memory of dining at this same restaurant with the hero party, where she explained that she must relish good food because so often she'll never have the chance to taste that same flavor again. In response, as a reward for their quest, Himmel asks that the head chef, Lecker, make sure that the taste of the food remains unchanged in the future. In the present day, Freeren tries the food and comments that the taste has changed, but she smiles and realizes that it's become even better than before. Stark is seen meditating on a cliff whilst an old man watches over his progress. Freeren, looking for Stark, notices the old man and inquires about him. Stark tells her the man is a stranger. 
Free Ren seeks Stark's help as she angered Fern. Stark and Free Ren are then seen approaching the angered Fern. Stark attempts to placate her, however, Fern unexpectedly replies, wanting to eat snacks. Free Ren's party then head to a bakery, where Free Ren and Stark are struggling to pick out sweets for Fern. Lavina and Kana are then seen entering the bakery, where they proceed to converse with Free Ren's party before they all leave together. Whilst on the streets, Weirbull interrupts the group. He and Sharf inspect Stark's strength and musculature before he requests to borrow Stark as he requires a vanguard. Stark departs with Weirbull and Sharf, whilst Free Ren, Fern, Lavina, and Kana return to Free Ren and Fern's inn. Lavina and Kana gift Free Ren with a basket of treats for helping them pass the first stage of the exam, which makes Free Ren recall one of Himmel's motivations for helping people, which was to be remembered by them, and that to be remembered, you just had to change someone's life a little. In the present day, Free Ren smiles, realizing that she has touched Lavina and Kana's lives. Fern is seen to brighten up with the sweets. Birds then fly to each of the examinees still in the exam with details about the second stage. Their proctor is to be sense. Free Ren's party and the other first class mage candidates face their second exam, a dungeon raid into the ruins of the king's tomb. The examiner, sense, lays out all the rules. Reach the deepest chamber of the tomb before dawn and they pass, otherwise they fail. She hands them each a bottle containing a golem that can whisk them away to safety if they break it, but warns that doing so will also end their exam. Bly objects to the unfairness of the test, pointing out that no one has ever returned alive from the tomb, let alone mapped it. Sense replies that a true first-class mage must be able to overcome the impossible and venture into the unknown. Method, another candidate, asks how they will prove their achievements. Sense says that she will accompany them as an observer and witness their success or failure. She then declares the start of the exam. Richter notices that there are multiple entrances and relays that to Denkin. Denkin recognizes the dungeon as a relic of the Unified Dynasty era, when such tombs were designed with many paths, but all of them led to the innermost depths. He then suggests to Ton that they should cooperate with each other since there's no need to compete. Ton scoffs at his proposal, saying that there's no obligation to do so and that there could be a risk of becoming a sacrificial pawn for another examinee. He also distrusts Denkin because of his knowledge of dungeons and decides to go solo. Weirbull forms a group, but with only his team from the first exam. Denkin shakes his head at their foolishness. Free Ren tells Fern that it's time for them to enter as well. Sense follows them, thinking that they are the safest option. Free Ren warns her not to get in the way, and Sense promises she won't get in the way or lend them a hand. Free Ren guides them through the dungeon, choosing the safest route. She advises them to be cautious and map their progress. She spots a trap tile and alerts Fern, who compliments her dungeon expertise. Free Ren says she learned from experience. She explains that Himmel had a passion for dungeons. Fern wonders what she means by passion. Free Ren says he was thrilled by dungeons, which she finds rather insane. The scene shifts to a flashback of the hero party. They stand at the top of a staircase that leads to the lower level of a dungeon. Himmel declares that they took a wrong turn and suggests going back to the previous fork. Hyder agrees, but Eisen protests, saying that they should go deeper to find the monster. Himmel chides Eisen for his impatience and declares that they must explore every nook and cranny before moving on. Free Ren gives him a strange look and he asks her if he thinks she's crazy. He says he wants to have fun while helping others, and Free Ren warns him that the dungeons will get more dangerous as their journey progresses. Himmel says that he will enjoy himself until the end. He says he dreams of an adventure where they raid dungeons, slay monsters, find treasure, and then realize that one day they've saved the world. He jokes that there may be a rare grimoire hidden in the other direction, and Free Ren suddenly changes her mind and wants to go back. As others enter the dungeon, Free Ren and Fern encounter a chest. Free Ren senses its mana and thinks there is a grimoire inside. Fern tells her the spill Mikite, which analyzes treasure chests, and shows that it's a mimic. Free Ren says the spell is only 99% accurate, and Fern asks what she means. Free Ren says that the greatest mages have made historic discoveries by seeing through that last percent. She claims that based on her experience as a mage, she's sure that there will be a rare grimoire in the chest. She opens it, only to find a mimic that bites her. Free Ren cries out that it is dark and scary, and Fern tries to pull her out. Sense watches them with concern, wondering if she made a mistake in following them. Free Ren asks Fern to stop pulling her since she will get torn apart if she continues to do so. Free Ren enlightens Fern on what to do, which is the exact opposite of what she was doing. Free Ren tells Fern that she should shove her deeper into the Mimic so it will gag and stop biting her. Free Ren is finally freed of the Mimic. She then thanks Fern for saving her. Fern asks her how she deals with Mimics by herself, and she tells her that she blows them up from the inside with an offensive spell, but it makes her hair frizzy. Fern puts the pieces together and realizes that that is the reason Free Ren sometimes has different hairstyles from her norm. They then carry on. While traveling around the dungeon, they spot frozen gargoyles, which they destroy before they can move. They also find treasure chests, which contain things like medallions. 
Fern tells the rest of the group that this is going unexpectedly smoothly. Free Ren tells her that she does have a point, telling her that it's strange for an uncharted dungeon, especially since they're close to the innermost depths. Free Ren tells her group that in spite of that, they should not lower their guard. They then take a break. Free Ren and Fern are looking over their pile of treasures, with Free Ren happily saying that there are some good items in the pile, while Fern thinks it all looks like junk. Sense does not understand Free Ren's fascination with the treasures, which is also Fern's opinion. Sense also tells Fern that she does not get her. She's never met a young mage as talented as Fern and assumes that she must have gone through many hours of training, but she cannot sense any passion or obsession in her. Fern tells her that she became a mage to repay someone for their kindness to her and that it was her life goal. She adds that she was too busy pouring her energy into her training to even think about any future beyond that, which must have burned through every last bit of her passion she had back then. Sense then asks why she continued in her pursuit of magic. Fern recalls the first time she and Free Ren raided a dungeon together. She tells Sense how much Free Ren enjoyed collecting magical items that she thought looked just like junk and that it made her smile. Fern tells Sense that she pursues magic with Free Ren because she likes seeing her happy. Sense gives her a smile and tells her that she was right to follow them along and that she is sure that they can have fun even in this dangerous dungeon. Free Ren's party reaches an entrance to a circular hall where Free Ren's clone is. She sees Denkin's group gathered there and asks them what they're doing. Denkin says that according to his knowledge of the dungeon's layout, the hall leads to the deepest level. Free Ren wonders why that matters. Denkin points to the clone of Free Ren in the hall which has been there for about half a day. Free Ren's eyes light up and she says that this is what dungeon raids are all about. Free Ren learns that her clone is a perfect copy, noting that it seems to have equal strength to her. Denkin tells her that they can't reach the depths without eliminating the clone and asks for ideas. Free Ren discusses what the weaknesses of the clone may be, assuming that since it is a perfect replica, its weaknesses may be the same as those of a mage made of flesh and blood. Richter adds that in order to defeat a stronger mage, you must use restraint or hypnosis magic. Free Ren tells him that she's resistant to both. Denkin says that it might create a small opening, which could be enough. Denkin remembers that Method is good at this kind of magic and asks her to perform it. Method attempts to restrain Free Ren to no effect, adding that it should work as long as there isn't a big difference in mana. She then asks Free Ren to look into her eyes in order to attempt to cast a hypnosis spell. Method is unable to cast the spell on Free Ren, claiming that she can't break through her mental defense. Free Ren tells the group that they have very little information and that they should be ready for a scenario where the clone doesn't have a mind. Free Ren continues, saying that they might have to take it down by brute force. Denkin asks Free Ren if she can do that and she tells him she's not sure. Fern joins the conversation, telling them that if that is the case, she might have to kill Free Ren's clone. Free Ren smiles and says that they should now come up with a strategy. Dunst arrives at the entrance of the hall where Free Ren's clone resides. One of the mages sitting at the entrance of the hall, Method asks where his party mate Edel is. He tells her that a clone of Sense attacked them, so she decided to give up. Method then asks where Bly is. He tells her that Bly bought him some time to flee and that he hopes that he managed to escape to safety. Dunst, now sitting with the rest of the mages, asks for cooperation as he has information. Denkin tells him that was his intention in the first place, and then proceeds to ask the group if there is anyone that can heal Dunst. Method has a scripture with her, so she can cast simple healing magic, which she proceeds to do. Dunst then reveals that the clones are mindless, and adds that according to Edel, they simply imitate the workings of the original mind, but don't have their own. Free Ren tells the group that they've lost the option to defeat it easily, so they must form a strategy with that in mind. Denkin tells Free Ren that there are still too many unknown factors. Denkin believes the biggest issue is the true identity of the clones and their summoner, and that they cannot take action until they understand its nature. Richter adds that they especially need to figure out whether the clone has any unique weaknesses, and adds that a clone that is as strong as Free Ren will likely lead to casualties. Denkin looks at Sense, hoping to get an answer, but as the proctor, she refuses to provide any information. Suddenly, Lavina and Kana arrive at the entrance of the hall. Lavina tells them that the clones do not have any weaknesses. She reveals to them that the identity of the controller of the clones is a demon named Spiegel, a demon which has been around since the Mythic Age. Denkin asks how she knows that, and Lavina replies that her brother was a member of the advance party of the Continental Magic Association sent to raid the ruins of the King's Tomb. Richter comments on this, telling her that it now makes sense how she managed to get this far. He also adds that he cannot see any logic in her behavior, and that she should have shared her information and cooperated with them from the start. She tells him that it did not seem like they could have worked together, and Kana adds that Free Ren and Fern were gone by the time that they realized that working together would be ideal. She also tells him that a middle-aged man like him would not hesitate to abandon his allies, adding to their unwillingness to cooperate. Richter concedes that he is indeed middle-aged, but her statement still hurts when said to his face. Kana tells Lavina that maybe she should apologize. 
Drawing upon the observations of the advance party, Lavina reveals that Spiegel is a harmless and frail monster lying in the treasury beyond the door that Freeren's clone is guarding, which Denkin's mana detection confirms. Denkin and Freeren reveal another problem in the form of the seal placed on the door, the sacrificial treasury door lock magic. This is considered to be a binding magic of the highest order that requires the caster's death to be unsealed. Freeren also deduces that the walls around the door are also similarly protected, leaving the group with no way through other than fighting the elf's clone. Lavina urges the group to act swiftly, as Spiegel's clones habitually gather at the deepest point. This is where the previous advance party, except her brother's unit, met their demise, and this is where the examinees are currently residing. Fern confirms with Dunst that the clones imitate the exact actions of their hosts and that their behavioral weaknesses would remain the same. With this knowledge, Fern reveals that the group may have a way to deal with Freeren's clone. Fern asks Freeren to stand next to a wall and proceeds to fire an offensive spell at her with the elf responding in kind with defense magic. Kana and Levine are unable to notice anything, but Denkin and Method are astonished to find a fatal vulnerability in that Freeren's mana detection is interrupted for a fraction of a second the instant a spell is cast. Lofen says that this is a common error for apprentice mages, and Freerin admits that it has been a weak point of hers for ages, and she did not mention it as it was embarrassing, to Fern's annoyance. Richter believes that almost no mage in existence would be able to exploit this vulnerability due to Freerin's extraordinary abilities. The group begins a strategy meeting with Kana and Lavine bickering in the middle at some point. As Freerin contributes to the meeting, Fern notices that she's practically enjoying the moment. A flashback begins to a time when the hero party strategized as they hid behind a broken down wall in the presence of a giant monster. The party reached a verdict as Himmel instructed Isen to grab the monster's attention while the rest of the party flanked the monster with Freeren providing covering fire. Freeren asked about Hyder's role and Himmel revealed that it was currently his hangover day which made him as good as useless. The flashback cuts as the party began to carry out their plan against the monster. With a smile on her face, Freeren reveals that she was just reminiscing about the hero party and how the discussions would go similarly to the strategy meeting the mages were currently having. With the strategy meeting concluded, Denkin asks Freeren if they can win, and she claims that dungeons that cannot be conquered do not exist, backing up her statement by saying that it is spoken by the mage of the party that has conquered the most dungeons in history. Denkin asks if the pair of Freeren and Fern will be alright fighting Freeren's Spiegel clone. Freeren assures them that they will be fine, explaining that it will be easier to predict the clone's movements with fewer people. She also points out that while victory would be guaranteed if the group of mages fought together, most would perish in the battle with no time to summon the golem to escape. Richter confirms that the rest of the mages are assigned to hinder the progress of additional clones heading toward the deepest chamber, as Freeren believes that being cornered on both ends would lead to everyone's demise. Freeren and Fern then enter the hall housing the elf's clone, while Denkin prays for their success. As the hall's door closes, Denkin and the rest of the mages begin to discuss which members of the group pose the biggest threat to themselves, in order to give everyone the most advantageous matchup possible. The battle commences inside the hall as Freeran engages her clone with destructive lightning, and the clone responds in kind with the same spell. Fern observes that the clone behaves exactly as Freeran predicted. Both Freeran and her clone cast Hellfire Summoning, which disrupts the clone's mana detection long enough for Fern to hide behind a pillar. Freeren deduces that the clone will now be on the lookout for Fern, but will struggle to do so, as it is occupied with an equally matched opponent. As the clone closes in on its original, Freeren reflects on the fact that she understands her own fears best. A short flashback begins from before the battle, where Freeren assures Fern that she has trouble detecting the human mage once she conceals herself completely. Fern asks Freeren about whether Zoltrak would be enough for an attack on the clone, to which Freeren responds that it's also the quickest spell to cast. Freeren explains that Zoltrak is a relatively new spell among elves, so she lacks the automatic reflexes to defend against it. This also means that the slightest of moments would have to be spared for her to initiate a counter. She also explains that Fern has been a natural user of the offensive magic since birth, rooted in her deep connection to the foundations of a natural mage, which is precisely why Fern's Zoltrak poses a mortal danger to Freeren. The flashback ends as Fern begins to cast Zoltrak directed at the clone who is in close quarters with Freeren. In another flashback, a scene reveals Freeren and Sari engaged in conversation. Sari believed she would never meet Freeren again due to Freeren's apparent disdain for her. Freeren then unveils her true purpose, delivering the last will of the deceased Flam. It had been 50 years since Sari had last encountered the human mage. Sari, without displaying any particular emotional reaction, simply claims that Flam had been a pupil she'd raised on a whim after being asked by Freeren if the news saddens her. Sari proceeds to read the will and notes that it resembles more of a report than a will. 
When Freeren inquires about the content, Sari shares that the Emperor had given official approval for widespread research and exploration of magic within human societies, which once viewed all forms of magic as demonic. Flem had played a pivotal role in influencing the Emperor's decision, even taking on the task of educating the newly established Imperial Mages. The primary purpose of the will was to implore Sari to assume the responsibilities left behind by Flem. Sari expresses disdain at Flem's greediness, as approving the research of magic had already been a major achievement. When asked by Freeran about its significance, Sari explains that it means that the largest empire on the continent has now begun to research magic and use it for military affairs, which will encourage surrounding countries to follow suit, with magic spreading over the continent in just a few decades. This signifies an era in which mankind will be able to use magic and in the foreseeable future oppose the Demon King and his army. Suri and Freeren both smile as they reflect on the significance of this change, and Freeren comments that Flem's achievements are truly incredible. The moment is abruptly disrupted when Suri reveals that this is not what she truly wants. She tells Freeren to return and declares that she would never agree to such a will. Suri explains that magic is meant to be special, and she does not intend on teaching anyone who is not talented. With disappointment, Sari claims that she and Flem could never truly understand each other in the end, reinforcing her earlier statement that she only raised Flem on a whim. Free Ren then mentions that Flem had already predicted Sari's exact reaction, surprising Sari. Free Ren adds that Flem still wanted to tell Sari that her dream had come true regardless. Before Free Ren takes her leave, Sari invites her on a walk, claiming that they have all the time in the world. As the two stroll through a forest, Suri reveals that Flem's dream was an era in which anyone could use magic, adding that things like serving mankind and opposing the Demon King had not mattered to the human mage initially. Suri discloses that Flem's cherished spell since her childhood was the seemingly trivial spell to produce a field of flowers, a preference that had always baffled Suri. Flem's deep love for magic was so profound that she wished for the entire world to embrace such magic, a dream that Suri initially dismissed as something befitting only young girls. She believed that such an era would unfold only long after Flem's own lifetime, given the transient nature of human existence compared to an elf's enduring life. Nevertheless, Flem ultimately became the pioneer of humankind's magic. Freeren opens up about Flem's characteristic hastiness in making decisions, as if she was always in a hurry. Suri explains that the lifespans of humans means that they exist in a place far closer to death than the two of them, and that they cannot afford to postpone crucial decisions. This stands in contrast to elves who can choose to defer the same decisions for a century or even a millennium. As the two elves approach a cliff, Suri tells Freeren that with Flem's efforts, the era of humans is rapidly approaching. In a mere thousand years, humans will begin to overtake elves in magic. Suri instructs the young elf not to neglect her training, emphasizing her point by saying that if Freeren is to lose her life, it will either be at the hands of the Demon King or a human mage. With a smile, Freerent responds that she's looking forward to that era, as she will have the opportunity to encounter various new mages and spells. The flashback then cuts to the present battle, where Fern successfully lands Zoltrak on Freerent's clone as Freerent smiles triumphantly. The clone manages to block this attack. Freerent tells Fern that everything is progressing as expected, and that the two will now engage in a battle of attrition with the clone. Meanwhile, Richter and Lavine are grouped together, ready to confront the clones of Lavine and Kana. Richter advises Lavine not to get in his way, to which she retorts, claiming that the same could be said for him. Method notices that Sense's clone cannot be sensed at all. Freerun acknowledges this problem and emphasizes that Sense's clone cannot be underestimated, as the worst case scenario could result in the deaths of both her and Fern. As the other mages wage their own battles, Freerun and Fern continue to battle against Freerun's clone, as Freerun tries to think of a way to create an opening that Fern can detect and take advantage of. A short flashback from before the battle shows another conversation between Freerun and Fern, where both realize the need for a greater opening than just mana detection for the two to emerge victorious. Freerun assures Fern that she will create an opening for the clone to attack her, and that as long as she makes an opening, her clone will make a bigger one in turn. Fern is concerned, but Freerun assures her that it would not be fatal as long as she can concentrate on her defenses. Before Fern can decide on a strategy, Freerun tells her apprentice to surprise her, as she's always underestimated Fern, which relieves Fern and assures her of a chance for victory. As the flashback ends, Freerun's clone fires an offensive spell that breaks Freerun's defensive spell and damages her before attempting to fire another one. Fern manages to catch the clone off guard with another Zoltrak to separate Freerun and her clone before bombarding the clone with multiple offensive spells that manage to inflict fatal damage. Before Fern can end the battle, the damaged clone casts an undetectable spell from the ground that pushes Fern violently against the wall and breaks her staff. Fern deduces that this is the apex of magic but smiles as the spell creates a very big opening for Freerun to destroy the clone. 
Freeren praises Fern and states that it has likely been 80 years since she's had to resort to using that spell. With the clone finally defeated, Freeren was finally able to conquer the dungeon by firing at the now defenseless Spiegel. This results in the destruction of all the clones in battle with the mages. With the dungeon now conquered, Sense stands between all of the successful mages and a mountain of treasures. She congratulates the mages on their achievement that rivals that of first class mages, and accordingly states that they have passed the second stage of the exam. Denkin asks where the greatest contributor to the group's achievements, Freeren has disappeared off to, only to find the elf stuck inside a mimic chest, requiring Fern's help once more. Lafen supposes that she can relate to the elf's sentiment. Outside the dungeon, the failed mages all gather together. Stark continues meditating as the unnamed elderly man continues to overlook him, stating that the art of battle is an endless path and that Stark is one step closer to the truth. He departs, reiterating that he has nothing more to impart to Stark, leaving the young warrior bewildered once more. As the man leaves, Stark notices a disgruntled Fern approaching him with visible anger and fearfully asks why. Crouching next to Stark, Fern tells him that she had an argument with Freeren, as Stark notices that the arguments have been coming rather frequently. With the third stage of the exam looming, Stark tells Fern that this isn't the time for them to be fighting as she cuts him off, explaining that this particular argument hurt her deeply. She had expressed her desire to repair her staff, which had been shattered during the second stage of the exam. In response, Freeren had suggested replacing the staff since it was beyond repair. While Fern understands the practicality of the suggestion, she reveals that the staff was a cherished gift from the late Hyder, and had been a part of her since childhood. Stark assures her that Freeren bore no malice, but a saddened Fern explained that she could never imagine parting with the staff. Back in town, Kana is seen hanging out with a dejected Lavine. Kana contemplates the lengthy three years until the next first class exam, and Lavine half-heartedly requests Kana to tease her as usual, despite not being in the mood for it. Kana offers a head pat, which Lavine quietly accepts, leaving Kana taken aback. Lavine tells Kana to hurry just as Freeren approaches them, carrying a bag filled with the broken shards of Fern's staff. Freeren enters Richter's shop to the shopkeeper's anguish as he wonders if he was having an unlucky day. Freeren reveals that she has asked around town and found out that Richter is capable of repairing any staff in his shop regardless of the damage. Richter tells Freeren to show him the staff before expressing unhappiness that Freeren had handed him apparent chunks of trash. Freeren responds saying that it may not be trash. Richter states that he was starting to feel better and was now back in a terrible mood thanks to Freeren, refusing to work on the chunks of the staff given to him. Freeren prepares to leave as she takes his response as him saying that he does not have the ability to work on this staff, which irritates him enough that he begins to work on it. Richter begins to repair Fern's staff as Freeren reads from a pile of grimoires on a desk. Freeren asks if Richter can repair the staff by the end of the day as she would like the staff to be fixed in time for the third stage of the exam to the shopkeeper's annoyance. As Richter finally finishes his repair, he apologizes to Freeren for calling the staff a piece of trash as it was apparent that the staff had been meticulously maintained and treasured. Meanwhile, Stark, who had gone out with Fern for food, says that it's time to head back. As they walk back to the inn, Fern complains that Freeren does not understand her. Stark responds that he also does not, which only serves to anger Fern to the point of hitting him. Stark says that this lack of understanding is why it's important for him and Freeren to keep trying to get to know Fern, and that he believes Freeren is trying her best. As Fern enters her room, she's surprised to find her fully repaired staff on her bed and Freeren already asleep. A short flashback begins where a young Fern is conversing with a sickly elderly Hyder, who explains that Freeren lacks emotions and empathy to the point of causing difficulty for others. He explains that this issue sheds light on Freeren's best quality, that she is aware of and will worry about such things. With this, Fern looks fondly upon her staff with a smile. The next day arrives and the 12 mages who pass the second stage of the exam gather in front of the first class mage Falsh, who states that he will commence the third stage exam. Falsh reveals to the 12 mages that Siri will personally interview everyone. Freeren realizes that Siri has no intention of letting Fern and her pass the exam. Fern asks Freeren if she is acquainted with Siri, and Freeren responds that they had been a long time ago. Freeren explains that Siri will likely rely on her instincts to determine who passes, adding that her pure instincts have never been wrong, and Freeren herself never became the mage that Siri wanted. When it's her turn, Freeren approaches Siri, the latter remarking that Freeren also couldn't envision herself as a first class mage. Suri states that it's because Freeren doesn't anticipate Suri passing anyone. Suri allows Freeren a chance at passing and asks her about her favorite spell. Freeren doesn't hesitate to say flower bed making magic, the same spell that her master Flam taught her, which Suri finds foolish. Suri rejects Freeren and Freeren heads back into the building. Suri expresses disbelief that someone like Freeren had defeated the Demon King as the latter did not even try to stand her ground after being ridiculed. Freeren replies that the feat was done by the hero party and that if any one of the members were to fall, then they all would have fallen. 
Sari states that Free Ren was lucky to be blessed with comrades, a statement that Free Ren fully agrees with. A flashback begins to a time when the hero party was camping. Free Ren approaches Himmel and asks him why she was recruited, as Himmel replies that they were looking for a powerful mage. Free Ren retorts that powerful mages were plentiful in the royal capital and that she didn't have to be the one. Himmel responds that he thought Free Ren was good, which causes Free Ren to continue to ask why. Himmel states that although Free Ren does not remember, the two have already met in the past. He explains that when he was a child, he had gotten lost in a forest while searching for herbs and had despaired at the thought of never being able to return to the village again. Just then, an elf approached him and frankly told him the directions of a nearby settlement, causing the young Himmel to think that she was a very cold person. Unsure if it was done on a whim or if the elf had sensed unease, Himmel states that the elf had shown her flowerbed making magic as the young child realizes for the first time that magic could be beautiful. As the flashback ends, Free Ren tells Sari that although it was just a mere coincidence, Flam's magic was the reason that Free Ren was able to meet Himmel and the rest of the party. Before leaving, Free Ren cautions Sari that even if she intends to reject Fern, she won't be able to because Fern will exceed her expectations as a sign that the era of humans has already arrived. As the moment for Sari to interview Fern arrives, Sari, puzzled, ponders the meaning behind Free Ren's words. Fern ends up passing, and Free Ren congratulates her, patting her head. Denkin approaches the two and thanks Free Ren for allowing him to get closer to his goals, as he now plans to return to his hometown and visit his wife's cemetery. Free Ren responds with a smile. As the others converse, Free Ren sits by herself, content with her purchase of a stack of grimoires, remarking that she expects nothing less from the magical town of Elverst. An elderly woman accidentally drops a basket of fruits right in front of Free Ren, who watches on. Weirbel approaches the woman and uses magic to help gather the scattered fruits. Afterwards, he walks up to Free Ren, who has resumed reading her grimoire. Weirbel tells Free Ren that he would not ignore a situation like that, and Free Ren admits that she was briefly concerned. Weirbel expresses mild surprise, mentioning that she was a comrade of Hero Himmel. Free Ren bluntly asks Weirbel to clarify what he means and adds that she should be the one surprised. She tells Weirbel that she's heard Fern's complaints about how he attempted to kill Fern and her team during the first stage of the exam, and that Fern described him as someone who would kick the hell out of a dog. Weirbel smiles, seemingly unfazed by the description, and explains that he was simply making threats. However, he implies that there is one person in the world whose death would be beneficial. He reveals that the special privilege of being granted any magic he desires was his primary motivation for becoming a first-class mage, believing the more powerful his magic, the more demons he could defeat. He emphasizes that he'll always lend a hand when possible, even if it doesn't directly relate to his goal. Free Ren questions why, and Weirbel is taken aback as he continues to speak. Weirbel explains that his hometown is in a remote northern region and that he's heard many stories about Himmel there, including his conquest of the Thousand Mirror Tower, battles with immortal bows, and encounters with the Hell Emperor Dragon. Weirbel explains that when he was a kid, he enjoyed reading stories of said exploits, but was never told about similar feats by the elderly in the village. Instead, the elderly would tell the young Weirbel about seemingly bland actions, such as eliminating small monsters, escorting merchants, and transporting goods for the village. Despite this, a young Weirbel observed that the elderly would always talk of these accounts from the bottom of their heart. He added that he finally understood once the demon remnants began attacking after Himmel's death that the epic tales of the hero party were irrelevant to his village as everyone had their hands full on protecting their daily life. Weirbel asserts his belief that if Himmel had not come to his village, it would not exist, even if the world became peaceful. Freerin continues to listen and asks Weirbel what he's trying to say. He declares that the silly adventure stories of hero Himmel were what brought him this far before taking his leave, adding that he had taken too long with his stories as his companions are seen waiting. Before taking his leave, Weirbel urges Freerin to treasure the people she meets, as final farewells do not always happen because of death, before surmising that Freerin is probably all too aware of the same. A short flashback begins as the hero party is providing help to a man. Isen asks Himmel the point of such a trivial assistance when their main goal is defeating the Demon King as soon as possible. Himmel agrees that their help is truly trivial, but he has no intentions of forsaking anyone who requires his help. As the flashback ends, Freerin looks on at the three of Weirbel, Scharf, and Era before expressing pleasure for Himmel that the world truly is changing. Later, at the inn, Fern explains that the special privilege conferment will be occurring on the same night. She notes that since the mages may bring companions, Stark and Freerun should come along with her. Fern notes that Freerun is making an extremely reluctant face. Soon after, a mildly pleased Freerun looks on as Fern informs the receptionist of the Continental Magic Association that she was told she could bring companions. The receptionist apologizes and states that Sari has decreed that Freerun is to be forbidden entry into any Continental Magic Association facilities for the next millennium. Fern is displeased and wonders what Freerun did, as Freerun explains that Sari is childlike and took offense to Freerun's conduct during the interview. 
Freerin says she will wait outside, adding that she didn't want to attend in the first place. Stark notices Fern looking unhappy and tells her that he will accompany Freerin outside, causing Fern to smile as the two leave the premises. Outside the Continental Magic Association building, the evening bell ring, and Stark remarks that Sari should be done awarding special privileges soon. Freerun reflects on Fern's achievements, adding that not even 50 mages have reached the status of first class. Freerun says that Fern will surely be a famous generational mage, and Stark shares Freerun's happiness. Later, Lernan approaches Freerun as Stark asks who he is. Freerun supposes that he must be from the Continental Magic Association. Lernan introduces himself as a first class mage and one of Ceri's apprentices. Lernan notes that Ceri must have caused trouble for Freerun, but Freerun brushes it off. Freeren notices that Lernan can see the instability in her mana, adding that he is incredibly skilled and unsuited for a peaceful era. Lernan agrees, stating that he's old-fashioned and only knows how to battle. Lernan explains that Sari has often told him that he would have made a mark in history if he'd been born during the era of war against the Demon King. Freeren asks what this has to do with her. Lernan continues to explain that the only apprentice of Sari who has made a mark on history is the great mage Flam, who almost seems mythical. Lernan believes that another living proof of Sari will die with him as he dies of old age, and that he does not wish such desolation for his master. To that end, he says that he will bear the notoriety of killing the legendary Freeren to prevent such a thing from happening before beginning to cast an offensive spell. Freeren casts a defensive spell, but is unable to stop the full force of it, damaging her shoulder. Lernan asks Freeren to duel before Freeren rejects the notion, remarking that there are too many tactless mages who only know how to battle. Freerin reasserts that Sari is childlike and is not capable of honestly expressing her feelings with her apprentices. A flashback from when Sari interviewed Freerin occurs. Before leaving, Freerin notices the flower bed outside the building has been made with the very same magic that Flam enjoyed, despite Sari decrying it as useless. Sari stares at the flowers before frankly explaining that Flam was a failure who could not reach Sari's height despite her talents. After Flam, Sari had taken on multiple apprentices, but all of them would die before reaching Sari's level. Sari remarks that it is strange that despite taking on all her apprentices on a whim, she can vividly remember their personalities and favorite spells. Sari asserts that she has not once regretted taking on disciples even if they fail to leave a mark on history. The flashback cuts to Lernan, who has now learned more about Sari. Fern approaches Freeren and tells her that the ceremony is finished. As they prepare to leave, Fern asks Freeren why she has a damaged shoulder and Freeren adds that she will need to get it healed at the church. With a slight smile, Lernan remarks to himself that he, Sari, and Freeren are truly tactless. The next day, Freeren, Fern, and Stark prepare to leave Elverst. Stark bids farewell to a group of townsfolk and the unnamed elderly man who helped Stark meditate. The elderly man states that the path of battle is long and treacherous and tells Stark to be well as he responds with a smile. As they bid farewell to the town, Fern notices that Stark seems to be well-liked no matter where he goes. Out of curiosity, Freeren asks Fern what magic she got at the ceremony yesterday, and Fern spreads her arms, asking if Freeren can't notice it. Freeren examines Fern's clean clothing and its floral scent before realizing that it is the spotless clothing magic. A smug Fern adds that this spell will make laundry much easier. Freeren remarks that Sari is truly a living grimoire, as the magic spell was said to have existed in the mythical era before patting Fern on the head. Fern, with a smile, adds that Sari looked incredibly dissatisfied when handing over the spell, and Freeren says that it served her right. The three then meet with Kana and Lavina, who give their thanks to Freeren despite having failed the exam. Lavina adds that it had been fun, and Kana tells Freeren to stay healthy. The two groups then bid their farewell. Fern notes that Freeren, just like with Sain, seems to bid farewell really easily. A short flashback begins to a time when the hero party bid farewell to someone they'd been traveling with for two weeks. Freeren similarly notes that Himmel seems to bid farewell easily. Aizen remarks that it doesn't suit someone like Himmel as they've spent a lot of time with the other person. Himmel responds that as long as the party persists on their journey, then they will be able to meet again, explaining that a tearful farewell would only make the reunion awkward. Continued Northern Travels Arc Freeren's party finds themselves in the Saum Marshes. Early in the morning, Stark returns to the group having caught some fish, which Fern includes in their breakfast. Meanwhile, Freeren is searching for something within the bushes. Stark notes that Freeren is uncharacteristically up early, and Fern explains that something of interest has awakened her. Freeren discovers a large crystal and hands it to Stark, who remarks that it looks quite pretty. Fern finds that she's unable to cast her fire magic to cook, as Freeren explains that the crystal possesses the power to nullify magic. To demonstrate, Freeren has Stark move away with the crystal, allowing Fern to cast her magic. Freeren reveals that the crystal is incredibly rare. Even a pebble-sized one would sell for a few gold coins, and the large one in their possession could even buy an exotic mansion. 
Fern reckons that keeping the crystal would pose too much risk for their journey, rendering both her and Freeren incapable of casting magic. Urging Freeren to dispose of the crystal, she emphasizes that an encounter with monsters would be dangerously compromised with its magic nullifying effect. Despite Fern's concerns, a self-satisfied Freeren moves on to explain another unique property of the crystal. She demonstrates its ability to store enormous amounts of mana, causing it to glow extremely brightly. Stark comments on the crystal's radiance, while Fern, uninterested, urges Freeren to discard the crystal once again. Later, the party continues their journey toward the next village, expecting to arrive later that day. Fern notices that an area of the marsh is still engulfed from light from the crystal. Stark asks Freeren if they're near the northern plateau, and she explains that they are still a fair distance away, beyond a great forest and a volcanic belt. Despite Stark's concern about the volcanic belt, Freeren reassures him that it's been centuries since the last eruption, and the location now serves as a safe hot spring region. Before the conversation can continue, the ground beneath the party caves in, sending them airborne with Fern carrying Stark. The ground beneath them gave way, revealing a cavern filled with magic nullifying crystals. The disrupted flying spell left Fern and Freeren tumbling, and they landed on top of Stark's back. Freeren examines the party's surroundings, noting the unprecedented size of the crystal ore deposit. While gently petting the perturbed Stark on the head, Fern observes that it seems as though the cave is entirely composed of the magic nullifying crystal. Stark suggests the party could become extremely wealthy if they were to bring the crystals with them. However, Freeren explains that these crystals are the hardest material in the world, impervious to cutting or refinement with magic. She adds that such massive crystals are beyond humanity's reach. As the party starts to search for an exit, Freeren encourages Stark, emphasizing that the party will be counting on him. Freeren explains that the crystals have rendered her and Fern into ordinary girls, while reminding Stark that she hasn't forgotten him calling her a hag. A short compilation begins of the party exploring the crystal-laden cave and eventually making camp near a body of water. Fern notes to Stark that the cave is immeasurably large and may house a great monster. Fern confides in Stark, expressing her fear at being unable to detect any mana in comparison to the carefree demeanor of Freeren. She draws a comparison between the magic nullifying crystals and being cast into darkness, intensifying her unease. Before Stark can respond, a dragon emerges from the water, prompting Stark to swiftly grab Freeren and defend against the dragon's attack. An awakened Freeren identifies the dragon as the venomous Apex Dragon, a fatal matchup for Stark. Stark, now at a loss, questions why Freeren had been so nonchalant earlier. Freeren promptly declares that she had placed her life in Stark's hands, explaining that it had been that way since Stark was recruited since parties cannot function without such a trust. Stark counters this statement, stating that he only sees himself as a coward who flees at critical moments and currently can't stop the urge to run. With a smile, Freeren suggests they run together. Instructing Stark to close his eyes, Freeren tosses a chunk of crystal imbued with her mana toward the dragon, successfully blinding the monster. A short flashback begins with the hero party sitting in a dungeon together. Aisen asks Himmel how he could leave his life in Aisen's hands, considering Aisen was just a man who had abandoned his village. Himmel explains that whenever Aisen feels the urge to run, everyone will run with them, as they are a party after all. The hero party is then seen fleeing from a dragon, with Hyder carrying Aisen and Himmel carrying Freeren. As the present unfolds, the hero party's escape from the dragon mirrors that of Freeren's party, with Stark running while carrying both Freeren and Fern. Finally making their way out of the cave, Freeren remarks that it had been a scary experience and that it isn't so bad to flee from battles together to Stark's agreement. As Freeren and Fern prepare to leave, Stark reveals that his legs have given out and that he can't walk anymore. Stark, returning to the party's camping spot with a basket full of lunch ingredients, wonders if the items will be good enough. A glance around reveals Fern and Freeren are missing. He assumes he's back earlier than expected. Stark decides to head off to catch some fish, expecting a significant haul. Meanwhile, Freeren and Fern sit beside a river, the latter gently washing Freeren's hair. Freeren remarks on the coldness of the river water, and Fern advises her to endure it until they reach the next hot spring. Fern meticulously cleans a bracelet, identified by Freeren as the mirrored lotus bracelet gifted by Stark. With a smile, Fern mentions that the hair ornament Freeren had given her has also been cleaned. Freeren observes that Fern seems genuinely content when taking care of her belongings, noting the smile on her face. Fern expresses that she finds joy in acquiring and cherishing gifts, especially since she lost everything, including her hometown, due to a war. Freeren suggests that her efforts in selecting the ornament were not in vain, and Fern comments that it must have been perplexing for her. Freeren wonders how Fern came to know this. Stark walks in on Fern and Freeren, prompting the latter to label him a pervert. After the two dress, Fern ties Freeren's hair while Stark, kneeling, apologizes and states that he did not know the two were bathing. As she finishes Freeren's hair, Fern insists that she was not particularly angry at Stark. As they continue on their journey, Stark remains dispirited with Fern staying quiet. 
Freeran remarks to Stark that the atmosphere has turned quite gloomy, with Stark slightly moved that Freeran was able to figure it out. Freeran assumes that Stark and Fern are a bad match for each other since the atmosphere seemed tense at times, but Stark disagrees. Freeran asserts that she was the one who forced Stark into the party and urges him to tell her if his situation with the party is uncomfortable. Before Stark could respond, the party arrives at a fork in the road that leads to the northern plateau and the neutral harbor. Stark notices an inn right in front of the fork and the party decides to enter. As the three of them step into the bustling inn, they immediately spot Weirbull, Sharf, and Eris sitting at a table. Weirbull remarks on the surprisingly quick reunion with Freeran before warmly greeting Stark, expressing gratitude once again for his assistance against the Fresser Lion Boar. Weirbull mentions that he's hastily returning through the sea due to demons in the northern frontier going berserk again. He adds that he'll be traveling with Sharf and Era until they reach the port town of the Imperial capital. Era chimes in, noting Weirbull's complaints about seasickness, to which Stark remarks that Weirbull is a middle-aged man. Weirbull states that he had only recently been in his 20s and therefore is not middle-aged. Stark notes that Sane would often say the same. Weirbull reminds Stark of his proposal and inquires about his thoughts on it. Freeren, curious about the proposal, asks Weirbull to explain, and he reveals that the war in the north is not going well. Due to the undermanned vanguard, Weirbull suggests that Stark join him for two to three years until the front is stabilized, emphasizing that the decision is entirely up to Stark. Stark reiterates his role as the vanguard of Freeren's party. Weirbull, determined, expresses that he won't back off, willing to do anything to protect the very north. He seeks Freeren's permission to attempt to convince Stark further, and Freeren approves before Fern could interject. Stark engages in conversation with Weirbull's party, and Freeren observes that Stark appears to be enjoying himself, pondering if their party has been too strict for him. Later in the night, Stark is seen on the inn's veranda as Fern approaches him. Stark reassures Fern that he declined Weirbull's proposal. Fern questions Stark's certainty with his decision, and Stark reaffirms his commitment to Freerin's party. He recounts how he was on the brink of despair before meeting Freerin and Fern, throwing everything away in an attempt to escape. Stark believes that joining the party was not a forceful act by Freerin, but rather a result of gaining the desire to journey after Fern's encouragement. He implies that although Fern had not noticed, Freerin was the only one to have led him this far in the journey, and declares that he won't go anywhere. Stark implores Fern to be more gentle with him, and Fern complies, urging Stark to come to her for some caressing. Startled, Stark asks Fern what she's planning, as Fern thinks to herself that Stark is being a pain. The next day, Weirbull, Era, and Sharf exchange farewells with Freeran's party as they head off in different directions. Weirbull expresses disappointment at his failure to persuade Stark, but brushes this off as he's sure that Freeran's party will eventually visit the northern frontier. Freeran, with a smile, tells Stark and Fern that it's time to depart. They soon make their way to Fable Village. An elderly resident requests the party's assistance in polishing the statue of a great hero for the village. Curious about the potential reward, Freeren asks and the resident offers the spell to scratch one's itchy back, which causes Freeren to promptly accept the request. As the party heads toward the statue, Fern notes that Hero Himmel's statues really must exist everywhere, and Stark adds that such work involving attention to detail can be fun. Eager for the job, Stark prepares himself, but Freeran remarks that if the statue were bronze, it could be polished with magic, eliminating the need for Stark's assistance. Upon reaching the statue, Stark is surprised to find a depiction of a middle-aged, mustached man. Freeran introduces him as the Hero of the South, supposing it's the first time Fern and Stark have heard about him. Freeran explains that, like Hero Himmel, many heroes attempted to defeat the Demon King, with the Hero of the South standing out as the strongest among them. Despite Stark finding the title overstated, Freeran insists it suits the Hero of the South. Freeran delves into the past, recounting the menace of the Seven Sages of Destruction who controlled vital regions, particularly in the northern countries. Admitting the Hero Party only defeated two, with two escaping, Freeran notes Hero of the South vanquished the remaining three. Freeran adds that Hero of the South's feats against the Demon Army were remarkable as he single-handedly annihilated the army's frontline troops within a year. Eventually, he reached the northern end of the Northern Plateau, a crucial point in the army's supply route. There, it's said that the omniscient Schlacht, the Demon King's confidant with the ability to see a thousand years into the future, confronted Hero of the South alongside the Seven Sages of Destruction. Despite facing overwhelming odds, Hero of the South managed to defeat three of the Sages and engaged with Schlacht. As Freeran continues, the party observes the same story being recounted to children in the village through a puppet theater. Freeran states that numerous nearby areas were liberated from the control of the Seven Sages thanks to that battle. She remarks that the people's faith in the hero is so strong that it's believed that he's still in combat with Schlacht, as his corpse was never found. Freeran declares that she did not think that the Hero of the South could be devoured despite facing cannibalistic demons. With a smile, Freeran begins cleaning the statue, prompting a flashback to her conversation with Hero of the South. 
Freeren declined Hero of the South's request, asserting that she would never be able to defeat the Demon King. Hero of the South resigned to Freeren's refusal, expressing the belief that he had no words to persuade the elf. Freeren remarked that he spoke as if he already knew the outcome, a sentiment the hero confirmed. Hero of the South confided in Freeren, sharing that he'd become the strongest of mankind through his ability to foresee the future. He entrusted Freeren with his secret, trusting that she would never disclose his ability to a soul. The hero foretold that within a year he would face an attack from the omniscient Schlacht and the Seven Sages at the Northern Plateau, leading to his demise. He disclosed that, regardless of Freeren's assistance, he had already come to terms with his impending death and the realization that he wouldn't succeed in defeating the Demon King. Hero of the South then shared another prediction with Freeren, stating that she would eventually join the party of a young hero who would become the world's savior. Freeren refuted this prediction, finding it difficult to imagine. The departing hero of the South declared that the mentioned young hero would profoundly impact Freeren's life upon their encounter. Before taking his leave, Hero of the South requested a favor from Freeren, which she accepted. He requested that she convey to the young hero that Hero of the South, the strongest of all mankind, will definitely cut open a path for him, even if his exploits were to be buried and forgotten to history. The flashback ends as Himmel, Heider, and Eisen approach Freeren. Freeren successfully cleaned the now sparkling statue of Hero of the South, and the elderly resident rewards Freeren with the promised spell. The villagers appreciate the clean statue, and as Freeren observes their admiration, she reflects on how Hero of the South's prediction turned out to be inaccurate. Despite his resignation to being obscured by history, he had undeniably left his mark, remembered fondly by the villagers. Soon, Freeren's party makes it to Graf Dock's domain. Stark notes that it's been a while since the party visited a large town. Uncharacteristically, Freeren mentions that the party will be leaving soon after resupplying. Stark observes a magic shop, though Freeren shows no interest, reminding Stark that time is finite. Fern remarks that something seems off, while Stark reasons that Freeren usually tries to settle for a couple of months after reaching a large town. A butler approaches the party upon recognizing Freeren and extends an invitation from Graf Dock to his evening banquet. Despite Freeren's attempt to leave, the butler insists, expressing the Graf's desire to offer hospitality in gratitude for Freeren's role in the hero party that saved the domain. Later that night, Freeren's party shares a meal with Graf Dock. Fern observes that Freeren wears a reluctant expression as she expresses gratitude to Graf Dock for his invitation, while Stark is enjoying his meal. Graf Dock expresses gratitude to Freeren for her assistance during his great grandfather's generation, to which Freeren promptly asks what the Graf wants. Graf Dock, happy to head straight into business, divulges that the family's heirloom sword has been stolen by a demon. Freeren explains to Stark that a similar incident occurred during the generation of Graf Dock's great-grandfather, prompting Stark to remark that the sword seems to get stolen too often. Freeren accepts the request, and in return demands a grimoire, a proposal that Graf Dock finds agreeable. As the party heads in the direction the demon fled, an annoyed Freeren reveals that among the forceful nobles in the northern region, the Graf in this domain has always been unreasonable. She discloses that the hero party was once threatened with imprisonment if they failed to recover the heirloom. Freeren further explains that there had been no leads as to the whereabouts of the sword, and the hero party eventually discovered it at the summit of the Schwer Mountains. When Fern asks why the sword is frequently targeted by a demon, Freeren explains that the sword holds a special appeal to demons, as it was originally in the possession of a distinguished demon. Fern notes that despite all these challenges, Freeren still chose to undertake the request. In response, Freeren explains that it is inevitable, as refusing would render Himmel's efforts futile, and Himmel himself would not forsake them. A montage of scenes follows the party traveling and camping. Eventually, the party reaches a ruined village and encounters a cloaked woman. Freeren asks if the woman is a villager, to which she responds that she is a wandering priest. She continues to explain that she was mourning the village, which had been destroyed by the demon with a sword, who Freeren identifies as the suspect they're looking for. The cloaked woman leads the party into a burial site, explaining that a demon with a sword had committed slaughter in countless villages. As the woman invites the party to pray with her, Freeren fires a spell at one of the graves, revealing it to be empty, much to Fern's confusion. Freeren reveals that the absence of corpses indicates that the woman is the demon with a sword. The demon uncloaks, revealing the weapon. The demon reasons that the villagers' deaths were inevitable for the demon's sustenance, but Freeren responds that there's no need for the demon to consume humans. A battle ensues between the party and the demon with a sword, where Freeren swiftly destroys the demon with Zoltrak. A flashback begins to when the hero party first found the sword on top of the Schwer Mountains. Freeren remarked that it was cold and the request had truly been horrible, but Himmel responded that a troublesome request like this allowed them to defeat a demon and provide salvation for many humans. Himmel stated that this was why he would never forsake anyone in need. 
However, Hyder responded that Himmel simply liked to take on challenging requests, a claim the hero did not deny. Freeren's party is seen praying at the burial sites. Back in Graf Doc's domain, the Graf expresses gratitude to Freeren for recovering their heirloom sword. As the party begins to depart the town, Freeren remarks that they've obtained a nice grimoire. Fern states that Freeren must be glad, while Stark asks what the grimoire contains. Freeren responds that the grimoire contains magic that transmutes red apples to green apples, which Stark finds pointless. Soon, they find themselves in the Etwas Mountains. Stark remarks that the temperature has gotten warmer, prompting Freeren to explain that they're in a volcanic belt, and warm areas do exist in the northern countries. Fern enthusiastically infers that the party will finally have access to a hot spring. Freeren confirms and mentions that they'll reach the next village soon, where they can enjoy one. After an extended period of walking, Stark asks if it's nearby. Freeren, with uncertainty, mentions that she was sure the village was around somewhere. Eventually, the party arrives at a single cabin, which gives Freeren a bad feeling. While Stark plays with the kids in the cabin, a nostalgic elder reveals to Freeren that the village the party is looking for has been deserted for three decades, and the hot springs have all dried up. Stark asks how long it will take to reach the next village, to which Freeren responds it'll be about a week. When Stark inquires about other hot springs, the elder shares a story he heard from his grandfather 30 years ago about a secret hot spring in the Rear Mountains, which Freeren identifies as the secret hot spring of the Etwas Mountains. Freeren is uncertain about whether the hot spring still exists since it's deep in the mountains. She states that heading into the next town will bring the party to a hot spring sooner. After taking some time to think, Stark reveals that he has heard about the secret hot spring and requests that the party go check it out. Freeren initially refutes this, saying it's not worth the effort. However, Stark insists, emphasizing that they're already there. Eventually, Freeren, smiling, accepts Stark's insistence and departs from the cabin to find the secret hot spring. A montage of scenes followed, showing Freeren's party traveling, camping, and fighting a boar. During these activities, Fern observed that Freeren didn't seem enthusiastic about finding the secret hot spring. Freeren revealed that the hero party had wandered all over the Etwas Mountains to find the secret hot spring because Himmel wouldn't be satisfied until he'd explored everything about an unusual area. Just as Freeren mentioned the path to the hot spring was laden with monsters, the party encounters a three-headed dragon and begin to battle. After the intense battle, Fern noted that it was taxing, but the party finally arrived at the secret hot spring. Freeren pointed out that it would have been better to head to the next town. Stark and Fern found that the hot spring was shallow, only enough for a footbath, as Freeren continued to justify her stance. With a smile, Stark said that it was fine and that they could all get into the hot spring together, to which Freeren agreed. As the party soaked their feet in the hot water, Fern commented on the beauty of the landscape and asked Stark why he wanted to come to this hot spring. Stark revealed that he had heard about this place from Isen. A flashback showed Isen telling a young Stark during a meal about his reaction to the secret hot spring being a footbath, a pointless adventure that wasn't worth the effort. Isen added that it had been an interesting and unforgettable experience, as the pointless adventures with comrades were the ones that left timeless memories. In the present, Stark concurs with what Isen had said. When the party eventually headed their way back, all three were beaten up and dirty, and Fern and Stark agreed that it was not worth the effort. Next up, Freerun's party are in the Northern Lands, specifically the fortified city of Hive. Inside the inn that Freerun's party have rented, Fern, while reading a book, is having a conversation with Stark. She recalls the fact that Freerun has been constantly bathing in the city's hot springs since they arrived. Stark adds that every time Freerun leaves the hot springs, it's to go to a magic shop. Fern notes that the party will be staying for two more days and agrees with Stark that Freeren has been moderate in her behavior, attributing it to her strict treatment of Freeren. She mentions that they will be completely free tomorrow, and Stark plans to visit a weapons shop to get his axe sharpened. Fern reminds Stark that she is free too and calls him tactless. Stark, determined to retaliate and tease Fern, takes it a step further and invites her out on a date. Although Fern's facial expression remains unchanged, she drops her book in response to Stark's unexpected proposal. Concerned she might react angrily as she did before, Stark is surprised when Fern accepts his proposal and promptly leaves, stating that they will meet again the next day, which leaves Stark confused. Later, Stark, feeling worried that Fern may be angry, recounts all the events to Freeren over a meal. Freeren questions Stark's sanity and reminds him who he's talking to. Stark realizes that he's making an impossible inquiry. Undeterred, Freeren assures Stark that it's not impossible, stating that she is a young lady after all and would know how a maiden's heart works. Desperate, Stark decides to count on Freeren. Recalling the previous events, Stark asks Freeren what she thinks when he asks her out for a date. With confidence, Freeren remarks that Stark is an adult now and she'd be happy enough to treat him to a meal. Stark realizes that Freeren can't be relied upon as she now appears to act more like a grandmother to her grandchildren. Freeren sternly reminds Stark that it was the second time he called her something similar, emphasizing that there won't be a third, leaving him visibly apprehensive. Stark asks what would happen after the third time. 
Freeren reveals that she will cry and throw a tantrum. She adds that she is so scary when she resorts to such tactics that even Himmel trembled in fear of her tantrum that Hyder mentioned lasted for three whole days. Moving back to the topic, Freeren says that it is already known that Stark is somewhat insensitive. Stark confides in Freeren that it wasn't a situation where he could retract his original proposal to Fern. Instead, he was planning to ask Freeren about places that Fern would like. Stark decided that it's now his own responsibility to look for a place, but Freeren with a smile says that she might know of a few places that Fern might like. Freeren then shows Stark several places before finally reaching a high area that overlooks much of the city, noting that a quiet but open place is an option. Stark is impressed to see how much Freeren knows about Fern, but Freeren deflects, revealing that Hyder had told her every single one of Fern's preferences. Freeren believes that Hyder had wanted her to take a role of parent for Fern and adds that she had been initially unsuccessful in finding anything that Fern would have liked. Stark assures Freeren that she has been a good parent since she clearly still remembers despite being unsuccessful. In reaction to Stark's compliment, Freeren happily reduces the count to one, which Stark shows confused gratitude. The next morning, Fern asks Freeren to choose between two outfits. Freeren, still sleepy, casually claims the outfits are the same and requests Fern to tie her hair before she leaves. In response, Fern braids Freeren's hair angrily. Afterwards, Fern and Stark proceed with their date, and Freeren, once again in the hot springs, receives compliments from an older lady for her braided hair. On their date, Fern and Stark talk about Freeren quite a bit. Later that day, Fern and Freeren take a bath at the bathhouse. Freeren notes that Fern seems to be in a good mood and asks if something good happened. Fern, continuing to smile to herself, responds that not much happened. Later, as the party departs the city to continue on their journey, Stark observes that Freeren's hair has been braided once again. Freeren explains that these are good mood braids, leaving Stark struggling to tell the difference. Freeren's party then goes to the Nacharith region. Stark notes that the temperature has gotten colder, to which Freeren responds that they've left the volcanic region and are now approaching the border of the northern plateau. Before going through the border checkpoint, the party takes their time to resupply, as Freeren showcases her suitcase that is capable of carrying more things than it looks. The party swiftly passes through the border checkpoint, courtesy of Fern's first class mage status. As they proceeded into the northern plateau, Stark commented on the place appearing quite normal despite the warnings about its danger. Fern questions Stark's seriousness as Freeren realizes they're already surrounded by monsters, before instructing the two to prepare themselves. A montage follows, depicting the party battling various monsters before Freeren spots a village at nighttime. A relieved Fern stated that they'd been on guard for three whole days and hoped to get some rest, while Stark was convinced he was going to die in battle. A local villager offers the party a vacant cabin and seeks a favor in return. He explains that there's a formidable monster further up the road, which overwhelmed the chivalric order and deterred merchants from using the route. As adventurers rarely visit the village, the villager hopes the party can handle the monster. Freeren accepts the request as the party plans to head in the same direction before asking if both Fern and Stark are fine with it. The two accept the notion, but Stark asks why the villagers would willingly live in such a dangerous place if they could just head down south out of the northern plateau. The villager agrees that it's a place of utmost danger, but it doesn't change the fact that it's where they were born and raised. As he stares at his family, the villager says that this land is filled with his family's memories, and asks how one could abandon their hometown. Stark has a deep reaction to the villager's conviction, which causes Freeren to break out in a slight smile. The next morning, the party heads out on their way to confront the monster, which has stationed itself in the middle of the road. The creature brandishes its sword as Freeren orders Fern and Stark not to let their guards down, and the battle begins. The monster engages Stark, who holds it at bay until both Fern and Freeren are able to cast Zoltrak at it. As the monster's corpse fades into dust, Stark sits against a tree, reflecting on the monster's strength. Freeren explains that they have only just entered the northern plateau, and there will be many more monsters just as formidable. Fern remarks that the journey will not be easy. A demoralized Stark asks Freeren if they should have not just traveled by sea if they were going to face such tough opposition, as he believes that the costs would have been worth it. A short flashback begins as the hero party finishes slaying a monster. Aysen remarks that he did not expect a monster of such power to appear, while Hyder worried that he could have died. Freeren, mirroring Stark, commented that the party should have gone by sea if they knew that it was going to be dangerous. Himmel declared that this is the exact reason why they're there, as there are a lot of people in the northern plateau. Himmel continued, adding that he became a hero not only to protect his homeland, but also to protect others. The flashback ends as Freeren, calling upon the memory, tells Stark that there are a lot of people who call the Northern Plateau their home. Stark concedes with a smile, and Fern adds that they should do their best. Freeren and Fern begin to head out on their way before Freeren asks Stark why he's still seated. Stark explains that his knees gave out as Fern calls him pathetic. They next make it to the beer region. The party is seen walking through a town. Stark mentions that he did not know there was a town in the Northern Plateau, and Fern observes a lot of bars. 
Freeren explains that this area contains the only granary in the northern plateau, so brewing has been a particularly prosperous activity for a long time. The party is then seen eating a meal at a bar as Stark overhears one man discussing a certain Fass who is close to finding Beauchaft, while another casts doubt over the claim as he has heard about the endeavor since he was a child. Stark asks what the Beauchaft is, and Fern explains that she learned from Hyder that it is said to be the finest spirit in the world that was given up by a great emperor of the continent a long time ago. Fern adds that Hyder blamed Freeren for not having a chance to drink the spirit as Freeren explains that they were circumstances. As the party leaves the bar, Freeren states that she does not plan on staying for too long before a dwarf recognizes her and comes running towards her. The dwarf says that it's only been a century before Freeren, identifying him as Fast, corrects him and says that it's only been 80 years. Fast notes that being so precise over time is uncharacteristic of Freeren. Fast notices that there are two new faces with her before asking if the drunk was still with her. Freeren explains that Hyder had passed away peacefully and Fast reflects that he was too late. Fast continues, adding that he's finally found where Beauchaft is and requests Freeren's help since she can use magic. Freeren asks what it has to do with magic and Fast urges her to follow him. Fast leads the party into the mine, claiming that he had dug it all himself. He adds that although people typically associate dwarves with mining, since he grew up in a town he had to teach himself to mine for the sake of finding the finest spirit. Stark asks Freeren for an explanation and Freeren clarifies that Fast has an unmatched love for alcohol, going to the extent of searching for the bow shaft for over two centuries. Freeren explains that the hero party had to refuse his request, as a crying hider is shown being dragged away by Himmel. Fern asks Fast why he had to dig a mine for this, and he explains that a legend states the bow shaft was buried in the vicinity, mentioning that he chose to believe in the legend after finding a stone monument two centuries ago. Fern recognizes the writings on the stone monument as ancient elvish, and states that it praises bow shaft as the finest spirit in the world, written by Milliard. Fass is surprised that Fern can read the language at such a young age, and she explains that she was forced to learn the language by Freeren when she was younger since half of the world's grimoires are written in ancient Elvish. Freeren stares at the stone monument and reflects that it really was Milliard's doing. Fass explains that his dedication began with the stone monument, and now he was just a stone's throw away from Beauchaft. Freeren asks if he's finally found the ruins, and Fass affirms, leading them to a door with a powerful barrier spell. Fass expresses hope that Freeren will be able to break through it. Freeren analyzes the spell before deciding that it's impossible, which Fass doubts. Freeren explains that it would take too long and that both Fern and Stark hate waiting. Fass declares that she would be compensated and Freeren asks if it would be grimoires, to which he responds that he will give 20 Reich gold coins for the task. Freeren instantly rejects and Fass continues to beg for her help, exclaiming that it's been his life's work for over two centuries. Freeren rejects the dwarf once more as both Fern and Stark begin to reason with her, who states that this is uncharacteristic of both of them. Fern and Stark assert that the 20 Reich gold coins reward is too good to pass up as it could cover their traveling expenses and food for a long while. Freeren reasons that it would take two to three months to dispel the barrier as both Fern and Stark claim that that much is nothing. Stark formally accepts Fass's request to Freeren's dismay. Over the next few months, a montage unfolds, depicting Freeren analyzing and studying the barrier along with the party enjoying drinks with Fass. The montage concludes on the day before the barrier is dispelled. Fern remarks that Freeren doesn't seem too happy, which Freeren affirms. She continues, declaring that Beauchaft doesn't taste good and it's not worth dedicating a life towards. Fern mentions the inscription on the monument, prompting Freeren to explain that among elves, there are some who would do unimaginable things to relieve boredom and kill time. A flashback begins with a young Freeren approaching an elf who appeared listless, identified as Milliard. Freeren asked Milliard if all her time was really spent spacing out. Milliard asked if Freeren knew why elves tend to spend their entire lives in pursuit of something before explaining that it was to avoid becoming someone like her. Milliard continued by asking Freeren if she knew what it was like to pursue something for one's whole life before realizing that it would end up worthless. Freeren said no and asked what Milliard meant. Taking a sip from a bottle, Milliard declared that she was talking about herself and what had happened to her before commenting on the awful taste of the drink. Freeren identified the drink as Beauchaft, the drink used during a coronation ceremony despite being the worst kind of cheap drink. Milliard added that before she arrived at the village, she carved an inscription exclaiming the greatness of Beauchaft as Freeren asked what the point was. Milliard declared that there was no point whatsoever. The flashback ends as Freeren finishes dispelling the barrier cast on the door. The door opens, revealing a room full of bottles of Beauchaft. Fass observes that the bottles are preserved in good condition and exclaims in disbelief that the day has finally come. Fass hands Freeren, Fern, and Stark a bottle each and asks for a toast. Fast then takes a sip of the bottle before expressing surprise. Another flashback begins of the hero party leaving town. 
Himmel asked Freerin why she refused to look for Beauchaft, and Freerin responded by asking Heider if he liked alcohol. Heider instantly agreed to Himmel's disbelief. Freerin asked Heider what he would do if a drink he spent his entire life looking for ended up being disgusting. Heider took his time to respond before declaring that he would laugh it off and enjoy it with everyone. As the flashback ends, Fast struggles to describe Beauchaft, before Freerin swiftly declares that it is awful, to the point of being worse than any alcohol she's ever tasted. Freerin notes that Stark has not taken a sip in response to her and Fast's reactions and forces him to take a sip. Stark cries out at the awful taste of the drink before sharing a laugh with the rest of the party. Fast reflects once more on the taste of the drink before laughing, claiming that there is enough of them to share with the entire village. Later, Fast and the party are seen enjoying the drink once more with the rest of the village. Fast claims that it's been a disappointing outcome, yet it was the most fun evening he'd ever had. As the party heads off from town, he asserts that if one was going to have drink, they might as well enjoy it to the fullest. Next, Freerin's party makes it to the Norm Company territory. The party is having a meal while camping. Fern gives Stark his share of bread, which makes a clunking sound as it hits Stark's plate. Stark says that is not a sound food should make, while Fern remarks that they've only had hard bread for the entire week. Freerin, munching on her bread, tells the two not to expect much as the northern region is barren except for the beer region since there is no supply distribution, meaning that the hard bread will remain whenever the party camp, much to Stark's disappointment. Freerin reassures the party that they might be able to get some decent food a half day's walk away. After they begin walking, they eventually see the fortified town that impresses Stark. Freerin explains that the land is owned by the Norm Company and the town contains their headquarters. She continues on to say that they're an armed company with the power to network and distribute supplies all over the northern plateau from the beer region. For this fact alone, the Norm Company is seen as the de facto ruling force throughout the northern plateau over any nation. Fern reminds Freerin that she said there was no distribution of supplies, to which Freerin said that a lot could have changed over the passage of time, so the company may not be as powerful as it used to be. Freerin warns the two not to cause any trouble since the company would be influential regardless of circumstances. The party is allowed to enter the town, but the receptionist recognizes Freerin's face from his book and tells the party to wait a moment to Fern's confusion. The party is then brought before Lord Norm, the current president of the company. Norm recognizes Freerin as the hero party's mage and requests that she pays back her debt from 80 years ago in full. Fern asks if Freerin is actually in debt and Freerin tells Norm that she was told she could pay it back at any time. Norm disagrees as such agreements are not written in his document. Norm tells her not to rely on verbal agreement and that while his ancestor may have been lenient, he is not. Freerun offers Norm the party's funds, which consist of three straw gold coins, 20 Reich gold coins, along with some silver and copper. Norm compares the funds to that of a noble's, which pleases Freerun. Freerun, with confidence, tells Norm that his great predecessor had been a huge help to the hero party, so he can keep the change. After short deliberation, Norm tells Freerun that the funds are nowhere near enough. The scene cuts to Freerun in a miner's attire complete with pickaxe. Freerun tells Fern and Stark that she's been forced to work in the mine for 300 years, signaling the end of her journey. Fern is confused and a sad Freerun reveals that everything has been taken away as security for her debt. Freerun bids farewell to the two as she's carried away by two miners while Fern and Stark remain confused. Stark asks Fern as to what they're supposed to do and Fern says that they have no choice but to buy Freerun back. After a conversation with Norm, Norm tells the two that nothing can be done before handing Fern a document stating that Freerin's interest has accrued to over 500 straw gold coins. Norm adds that even if paid in Reich gold coins, it would still exceed 300. Later that night, Freerin is sitting in the mines as she complains of the heat and dust. A group of miners approach Freerin and one tells her that they've been informed by the president. Freerin, with a smile, begins working by casting a spell. Her spell marks a location that Freerin shows to the miner. He asks if Freerun is sure and she reminds him of who he is. The miner orders the rest to begin digging in the spell's direction. A flashback begins shortly before this scene where Norm had spoken with Freerun in the mines. Freerun noted that his great predecessor was a heroic man who invested in a barren land and built a distribution network for the entirety of the Northern Plateau. She continued to add that he was the same person who provided funds for the hero party with no expectations and no date for repayment. She claimed disappointment at being treated poorly by the current Norm. With a smile, Freerun expected that he must have a good reason since he came down to the mines himself. Norm expected that Freerun must know about the direness of the supply situation in the plateau, and Freerun recounted the party's experience with the hard bread. Norm explained that 30% of the company's armed caravan and army were lost when demonic activities rose up again and devastated the distribution network. Norm supposed that if the company was a country, it would have fallen long ago. However, since it is a company, he explained that with enough capital, they can rebuild as many times as needed. Norm continued on to say that Freerun's arrival had been akin to a blessing from the goddess as the promissory note suddenly had power to him. 
He explained that the mine is still under development and the presence of silver ore would result in an enormous profit for the company, to the point of being able to write off the hero party's debt. He expected that this is something that Freeren could easily do. Freeren finally understood the Norm's actions as he formally requested that Freeren help rebuild Norm Company's distribution network for the sake of the people of the Northern Plateau, adding that she may even enjoy soft bread at the furthest ends of the plateau as a result. With a smile, Freeren commented on Norm's shrewdness as a merchant, and accepted as she had always planned on paying back his great predecessor's kindness. The flashback ends as the group of miners are successful in finding a massive silver ore, contributing to Freeren's smugness. The next morning, Freeren, having gotten all of her belongings back, tells Fern and Stark that it's time to leave. Stark expresses relief as they were discussing how to save Freeren, with Fern planning to attack the mines at night, to Freeren's surprise at Fern's hot bloodedness. A smug Freeren tells the two that they will be able to eat soft bread from now on. Divine Revolt Arc Jino is in the ruins of a village in the Rufin region. A demon kneels before him, pleading for mercy and mentioning his young son. Dismissing the demon's words, Jeno silences him and swiftly eliminates him with a spell before the demon could attack. As Jeno searches the desolate home, he questions the truth behind the demon's claim about having a son, deploring the lack of honesty among demons. Reflecting to himself, Jeno reveals that Sari personally requested him to undertake the subjugation quest. Wondering what it could possibly be, he's confronted with his hometown reduced to ruins by demons. Jeno admits a lack of affection for the place, yet the sight causes him to feel lonely. While exploring, Jeno encounters a heavily wounded man. Recognizing him, the man informs him of their village's destruction. Jeno reassures him that he has already vanquished every demon. The man, fading into unconsciousness, inquires about the village's inhabitants. Jeno attempts to comfort him, promising that everyone is safe. With the aid of a new first-class mage who accompanies them, capable of healing the man's wounds as she can make use of the goddess's magic. Jeno enters a church where Methode awaits him. Methode asks him to bring the injured man to her, and Jeno expresses ire at her reactions, revealing the man has been long dead due to his festering stomach wound, despite his clinging to Jeno. Jeno continues to divulge that the man was the son of a baker who used to play with him when he was young, adding that the man succeeded the bakery despite his breads not tasting good. Jeno laments that he will never eat the bread again. He lays the dead man alongside the rest of the village inhabitants before a statue of the goddess, stating that the man won't feel lonely anymore. He contemplates why the village inhabitants had to suffer death, considering that they did not choose to engage in combat, unlike first-class mages like himself and Methode, who willingly put their lives on the line in battle. Methode tells Jeno not to blame himself, as the village had already been destroyed by the time the northern branch of the Continental Magic Association was notified by the chivalric order of the norm. As Jeno readies himself to explore the village once more, Methode suggests he take some rest. Jeno questions her proposal, slightly bewildering Methode. Before conversation can progress, he silences her, revealing that one of his birds has been taken down. Detecting two concealed mages, Methode begins to speculate about their identities, but the window overlooking them shatters. Freeren bursts through the window with the intent to attack, prompting Jeno to brace for the same. However, he recognizes Freeren and immediately halts, deducing that the other hidden mage is Fern. Freeren identifies Methode and Jeno, mentioning that Jeno's mana was so filled with killing intent that she initially thought it belonged to a demon, causing Methode to glare at him. Jeno apologizes for the confusion as Methode berates him for making her feel very uneasy. Freeren informs Fern that there are no enemies and to inform Stark of the same. Later, Freeren and Fern engage in conversation with Methode. Freeren discloses that Fern had also received the same subjugation request since they were already in the Northern Plateau. Freeren asks about the current situation. Methode updates Freeren and Fern on all that has transpired so far, with Freeren realizing that her party had been one step behind despite their efforts to reach the village quickly. However, Methode also reveals that there is currently a mysterious element that is concerning Jeno. Everyone assembles in front of the corpses of soldiers that Jeno explained belong to the chivalric order of Norm stationed in the village. Freeren reminds Stark that they are the military branch of the Norm company they already encountered. Fern notes the small size of the group as Jeno explains that it's not unusual. He further states that despite their small number, they were elite soldiers, too skilled for the village in fact, standing before the captain who had protected the village for many years. Freeren examines the captain's body and expresses surprise as he was clearly stronger than Stark. Stark acknowledges that it was obvious since everyone is stronger than him. Freeren asks about the cause of the soldiers' deaths, and Methode answers that her autopsy spell reveals they all died instantly from blade slashes. Jeno interjects that all the demons they found were weaklings, no match for the soldiers, suspecting that the demon responsible for their deaths is still alive. He adds that Freeren should be happy as her party's arrival had not been in vain, and with a smile, Freeren understands that she and her party can help demonstrate humanity's ferocity to the demon responsible. Freeren explains to Fern that demons generally conceal their mana for short periods, so they're probably outside of the mage's mana detection range for the time being. Freeren mentions that Jeno had informed her about areas where demons would be residing. 
so they move to investigate those places first. Before continuing, Freeran suggests that the group have their dinner first as she deploys the hard bread, much to Stark and Fern's dismay. Freeran tells them to be patient until the distribution network throughout the Northern Plateau improves. Methode offers to bring Jeannot's share of dinner to the church, but Freeran requests to hear her analysis of the enemy, prompting Stark to go to Jeannot instead. Freeran asks Methode if the enemy is a dual wielder, and she clarifies that the demon is a quadruple wielder. Methode finds it strange to enjoy food together with the two, as she did not expect to meet Freeran's party. Freeran agrees, recalling that they received a subjugation request from a squirrel while the party was camping on the other side of a mountain. Freeran asks why Methode and Jeannot are here, as it seems unlikely to be a coincidence. Methode reveals that Sari had personally tasked her and Jeannot with subjugating demons in the Northern Plateau. Freeran expresses relief that she did not become a first-class mage to avoid such work. Methode explains that it comes with being Sari's apprentice, a duty most first-class mages undertake. Fern reveals that she rejected Sari, and Freeran praises her for being a good girl. Freeran notes that it must be a hassle to have Sari giving orders, but Methode disagrees, expressing her desire to be more useful to her, as Sari is small and adorable, which confuses Freeran. Methode adds that Freeran is just as adorable before mentioning that Jeannot had taught her a lot on what not to become. Later, the group prepares to split as Freeran tells everyone to share information beforehand. Methode starts by revealing that traces of mana seem to indicate four demons were part of the main force that attacked the village, with one being a quadruple-wielding demon general. Stark asks what a demon general is, and Freeran explains that they are skilled demon warriors that rely on martial arts and strength and physicality through mana with some even spending several centuries mastering their arts. Freeran notes that there were generals who were much stronger than Aysen in the Demon King's army, which perplexes Stark. She adds that there is a good chance that the enemy at hand has an inhuman body, believing that a lack of experience against a master swordsman wielding four blades was what caused the demise of the Chivalric Order. Freeran suggests heading to the abandoned fortress first, since demons tend to hide in such places. Jeno says that he will catch up with the rest as soon as the Chivalric Order of Norm arrives, and Stark offers to stay in the village with him. Jeno questions Stark for leaving his friends without a warrior, but Stark says the same to Jeno. Jeno states that it won't be a problem as he can manage without a warrior, but Stark again says that the same applies to Freeren and Fern. Freeren says that it's only true to a certain extent, but agrees that they can just flee if things get tough. Stark remarks that Jeannot cannot abandon his own village as Jeannot reasons that there are only corpses around, and the former continues that despite this fact, he's still staying to protect the corpses, causing Jeannot to concede to Stark. As Freeren, Fern, and Methode leave, Jeannot tells Stark that he's a good person but won't survive for very long for that very reason. Meanwhile, the three of Freeren, Fern, and Methode walk through a forest. Freeren tells Fern to minimize the use of long-range detection as a skilled enemy could use it to detect the mages instead. Since the group is still a long way away from the fortress, Freeren encourages casual conversation as they walk. Fern expresses doubt about the group being so carefree, but Freeren emphasizes the importance of balancing tension and relaxation. She adds that communication improves teamwork, something she believes Fern might not fully appreciate. As a result, Methode asks if she can caress Freeren's head, revealing her fondness for patting the heads of tiny individuals. She mentions that Sari rarely allows such acts as she seems to dislike it. Freeren agrees with Sari, asserting that she won't permit head padding as she is a considerably more mature woman than Methode. However, when Methode conjures a grimoire with a spell preventing eggshells from falling while cracking eggs, Freeren takes the grimoire happily, allowing Methode to pat her head to her heart's content. When Freeren reads through the grimoire, Methode happily pats her head and then requests permission to hug her, explaining that Sari does not allow her to do so. Freeren grants Methode permission to do as she pleases, and Methode promptly squeezes Freeren in a hug, to Fern's annoyance. Fern begins to pull Freeren back, starting a tug of war of Freeren. The mage's comical moment is abruptly disrupted by the appearance of two demons floating in the air, instantly alerting Methode and Fern. Methode realizes that the demons managed to detect the mage's mana. Freeren notes that despite being aware of the mage's prowess, the demons seem eager to engage in battle. The two demons are identified as a katana wielder and a ritual staff wielder. The latter promptly casts the fog control magic Nebelladora, enveloping the surroundings in a thick fog, hindering both vision and mana detection. Facing an ensuing barrage of aerial attacks, Freeren grabs Fern, forcing the two to split away from Methode. Fern expresses confusion, noting that both demons are employing a flight spell. Freeren reminds Fern that demons once dominated the skies until 40 years ago, but Fern points out that demons often specialize in a single spell. Flying, according to Freeren, comes naturally to demons, not even considered magic. Freeren anticipates that Fern will encounter more such abilities in upcoming battles, and remarks that the demon's battle experience reminds her of the Demon King's army. A loud sound signals that Methode has engaged in combat, prompting Freeren to leave the battle to Fern. 
Confused, Fern questions this decision, and Freerun emphasizes that Fern is a first-class mage, and the mission is tailored for mages of her caliber. Before Fern can voice further concerns, Freerun reassures her. Fern has to quickly react to block an attack from one of the demons after Freerun points it out, and Freerun justifies her decision. However, Fern insists that her successful block was due to luck and feels outclassed. Freerun reassures her once again, expressing confidence in her victory. Freerun observes from a distance, remarking casually that it's not so bad to observe from afar. Attempting to hide, Fern's efforts prove futile as the demon asserts his magical fog's ability to react and capture even the smallest traces of mana, as no living creature can completely conceal their mana. Fern switches to offense and fires a Zoltrak at the demon, only to have it blocked. She remarks that in addition to her sight being obstructed, the demon proves to be a bad matchup for her. In the meantime, Methode finds herself engaged in combat against a sword-wielding demon. Sensing Fern's struggle against the other demon with unconventional abilities, Methode acknowledges the situation. The demon, casting a whirlwind attack spell, tells Methode to concentrate on her own battle, to which Methode concurs. As the two continue to exchange blows, Methode observes the demon's more conventional and solid fighting style. Despite the demon being on the offense, Methode struggles to find an opening. Recognizing that a head-on battle is not ideal, Methode decides that the best course of action is to allow Fern to play to her strengths by clearing the magical fog. Smiling, Methode remarks that it's time for her to get a little rough as she bombards the demon with Zoltrak before firing another one at point-blank range from behind. The demon is slightly damaged, but manages to block most of the damage with her sword. She knows that Methode's fighting style resembles that of a specific clan dedicated to hunting demons in the Northern Plateau. The demon points her sword at Methode and invites her to a good duel before the two continue fighting, evenly matched. Eventually, the demon notices something amiss with Methode's attacks, describing them as intense, yet lacking any intent to kill. Methode comments on the demon's sharp senses, but states that the demon was just too late, as she had finished analyzing the fog, much to the demon's surprise. Dodging through the demon's attacks, Methode asserts that those who only know fighting will only understand offensive spells, and that anyone else in her clan would not be able to break out of her situation as they do not realize how enjoyable magic can be. Methode then casts the Fog Dispelling Magic, breaking the Dome of Fog cast by the other demon. The demon battling Fern becomes distracted by the dispelling of the fog but continues undeterred, thinking that creating more fog is a viable option. The demon loses sight of Fern, only to be instantly shot down by Fern's Zoltrak. The sword-wielding demon continues in attempting to take down Methode before being forced to dodge a long-range attack. The demon spots Fern and is taken aback by the extremely long distance before suddenly coming to a Zoltrak shot. Methode smiles as the battle concludes, and Freerun, flying to Fern, notes how it becomes impossible to predict the trajectory of a long-distance shot from outside the range of detection. Freerun praises Fern's efforts, while Fern remarks that she does not want to have a battle as difficult as this one again. After Genoa and Stark finish off their battle, Methode says that Freerun and her party plan to stay in the village for a while as a montage of scenes begins to unfold, showing Freerun's party, Genoa, and Methode living together until Stark recovers from his injuries. Stark proclaims that his condition has improved as he proceeds to do push-ups. Freerun and Fern are weirded out by him, with the latter stating that he might actually be a monster. Methode approaches Freerun from behind and notes that her party does not seem to have a priest, offering her services as she will be free after the mission, and adding that it's dangerous to travel through the northern plateau without a priest. Freerun rejects this, assuring her that while she can't use healing spells, she can still use some priest magic, and when the situation becomes dire, the party can always run away as they always have. In addition, Freerun notes that she wishes to keep the position open for a certain someone that she believes they will meet again someday. As Fern begins to hug her, Freerun also notes that Fern seems to be in a bad mood whenever Methode is around. Despite this, Methode finds Fern to be adorable as she is cute even when she's angry. Jeannot tells Methode that the chivalric order of Norm has arrived and the two will be joining the escort until they reach the south. Jeannot asks Stark about his wounds and Stark responds that he's in perfect shape. Jeannot states that he's in debt to Freerun and her party and plans to pay them back one day before leaving. Methode calls out Jeannot and tells him to show gratitude. Jeannot yields and thanks the party as he and Methode take their leave. Stark asks Freerun if it was a good idea to turn her down, and Freerun reminds him that Sane is the priest of the party. Stark explains that they would not be happy to hear that they've rejected a beautiful mature lady. Freerun responds that it doesn't matter as she is already one, to Stark's agreement. To be continued. Did you enjoy our video? Be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.